welcome to the 2008 Women's College World Series. Go Gators. Very bright out. We don't see the sun very much in Blacksburg. Being here at the World Series is just what every college program wants to do. This is the place that every school talks about when they get together in August or September. It's something we've watched on TV since we're little and we finally made it here. <laughs> this way? <laughs> so this way? <laughs> being back at the Women's College World Series is like being back at home. We feel like we're Cinderella invited to the ball. We don't mind being called underdogs. And that story, Cinderella got Prince Charming, so we're hoping for a happy ending too. To be here in the College World Series. And knowing that they are the best there is for this one year. Be cool. Is magnificent. Phenomenal. Because it's everything we've worked for all year. It's payout time. But we're not done yet. And hopefully in a week it'll be a dream come true. One, two, three. Yes. Done. That's it. Whoa. Oklahoma is the capital of the softball world. Welcome to Oklahoma City and Hall of Fame Stadium. It is the first of four first round games today. The Florida Gators taking on Louisiana Lafayette. Let's take a look at this year's bracket. The number one overall seed is Florida. They're taking on the Raging Cajuns. Then in their second game today, it'll be Virginia Tech against Texas A&M. This evening, two games coming your way. Alabama against Arizona State, and then two-time defending national champion, the Arizona Wildcats will take on perennial power, the UCLA Bruins. Hello, everyone. Thrilled to have you along for a ride. Should be an absolutely spectacular field this year. Alongside my partner, Michelle Smith, I am Eric Collins. We have eight teams that are full of confidence right now. Maybe for the first time ever in this great event, we have eight schools that have a legitimate belief that they are the team to beat. Well, speaking with each team yesterday, every one of them not just happy to be here in Oklahoma City, but feeling like they are a legitimate contender for the national championship. And already history in the making, the University of Florida, the first SEC team to occupy the number one seed. Yeah, and the Florida Gators, they are deserving of that number one overall seed. 67 wins on the year just three losses. With a record like that, you'd assume they have a stud pitcher, and they do. Well, Stacey Nelson has been outstanding this year in the circle for the Gators. She is a power pitcher. You will see her work east and west. She's going to work a curveball, a screwball. She's going to need to be strong in the circle for the Gators for their run at the national championship. All right, the Florida Gators taking on the Louisiana Lafayette Raging Cajuns. They have a lineup from one to nine, they can all hit the softball very well. And their number one masher is Holly Tankersley. Well, Holly's just been outstanding this year for the Raging Cajun. She hits the ball for power. She leads the team in home runs, but she also leads this strong team in batting average, and you don't see that very often. So look for Holly to be hitting the ball a long way today. All right, let's get this thing going. For eight teams, years of hard work is about to pay off. We are moments away from starting an event of a lifetime. To be here in the College World Series is the first day of practice. This is what we've been working for. I still can't believe that we're still really here. We finally achieved it. It feels really good. One of the biggest dreams any softball player can hope to aspire to. This ESPN production is available on ESPN HD. This is game one of the Women's College World Series. The Florida Gators, the number one national seed, getting a chance for their first ever national championship in the game of softball, taking on Louisiana Lafayette. Co-head coaches for the Raging Cajuns. There's Stephanie Lotif. She is co-head coach with her husband, Michael Lotif. We'll see Michael Lotif. He is the third base coach for the Raging Cajuns. They have been on the job for the last six seasons combined as co-head coaches in Lafayette, Louisiana. All right, let's let introduce you to the Louisiana Lafayette starting lineup. Louisiana, and I didn't start playing softball until I was in ninth grade. My name is Vanessa Soto. I'm from San Diego, California, and my Raging Cajuns hat is my lucky charm. Holly Tangersley from Kirbyville, Texas. I'm a fifth year senior, and I play just about everywhere on the field. Hi, I'm Melissa Verde. I'm from Beaumont, Texas, and I wear number 16 because my dad wore it when he played college baseball. I'm Lana Bowers from Huffman, Texas, and I'm studying Spanish to be a missionary. My name is Gabrielle Bridges. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, and I was a homecoming queen my senior year in high school. 
Hi, my name is Brooke Broadhead. I'm from Lafayette, Louisiana. I've been playing softball with my teammate Carly Hubbard for 14 years. Hi, I'm Carly Hubbard from Lafayette, Louisiana, and I've lived in both South America and Africa. My name is Katie Smith. I'm from Reston, Louisiana. My teammates call me Junior because I'm the youngest member on the team. And this is what the lineup looks like for Louisiana Lafayette. They are a very good hitting team, 317 team batting average. They have 60 home runs so far in the season. They average over six runs per game. A big reason why is the senior transfer, Vanessa Soto. Well, Soto has just been an outstanding spark plug for this raging Cajun team. A welcome addition, transferred over from LSU, and she really has just done amazing things for this Cajun lineup. Rage's Cajuns may be up against it because they're running into a buzzsaw. Right-handed pitcher Stacy Nelson will get the ball here in game one at Hall of Fame Stadium. And if you look at her win-loss record, amazing, 45-3. and three. She's just been outstanding in the circle for the Gators. Again, she does throw east and west, so she's got a great screwball, great curveball, throws hard. She'll use her changeup to set up those pitches. Look for her to keep the ball out of the middle of the plate and on the corners. These two schools have met just three times in their softball histories. All three of those wins going to the Raging Cajuns. So they have never known defeat against Tim Walton and the Florida Gators. Three wins, no losses for Louisiana Lafayette against the Florida Gators, the last matchup coming back in 2002. So don't know how much bearing that has. There's Louisiana Lafayette. They have been to this tournament before. This is their fifth appearance in the Women's College World Series. First time, 1993, most recently in 2003. Very good program down in Lafayette, Louisiana. All right, we're ready to go. This is Valley Gaspar, designated player from Maurice, Louisiana. First pitch of the 2008 Women's College World Series. Wide of the mark, ball one. On base percentage of almost 500 for the leadoff hitter for the Raging Cajuns. You're going to score a lot of runs when that happens. Yeah, Eric, and that's a great point, is that your leadoff hitter, you want them to hit for average, but you also want them to have a higher on base percentage than batting average. That means that they are taking walks, they're hitting the ball, getting on base with errors finding any way possible to get on base and be a table setter. Nelson's 1-1 disappears underneath the bat of Gaspar, and she's now set up. Ball and two strikes. Nelson, the SEC Pitcher of the Year. 45 wins. That's hard to do. An ERA below one. Just misses outside, count even at two balls and two strikes. Nelson working that screw ball. She will throw that away from lefties. Nelson's 2-2. Swatted on and missed. First strike out of the game for Stacy Nelson. We'll probably see more of that as the afternoon wears on. Let's take a look at the defense behind Nelson. It's an outfield of Enea, Wallazonia, and Ratliff, and the infield from third to first. It's Brooks, Bush, Pakulba, and the first baseman, Gardner, behind home plate, highly thought of catcher in Christina Hilberth, catching the junior, Stacy Nelson. Wallazonia can play a little bit of everywhere. We've seen her in the infield in years past. As a freshman, she played right. This year, playing all 70 games in center field. And there she is, Junior from Fontana, California. This is Vanessa Soto, left-handed hitter. Transfer from LSU. Played three years of softball there before finishing off her college career down in southwestern Louisiana. Soto is actually the only person in this lineup that has experience against Stacey Nelson and the Florida Gators. She played in the SEC over the last three years with LSU, so she got a chance to get a good eyeful of the Florida Gators. And when we spoke with her yesterday, she spoke with a lot of admiration for Stacey Nelson. She knows the caliber of pitcher that Nelson is in the circle.
And again, that ball just disappears underneath the bat. And Soto strikes out. Two up and two down, both of them punched out by Stacy Nelson. Well, right now, it looks like the Cajuns are going after pitches that are low or out of the zone. And look at the way Nelson comes out. Looks like a drop ball down in the zone. It just disappears. And when you can get the offense swinging at a low pitch or a low drop that's going to move from low to lower, it makes your day a lot easier. So far, Stacy Nelson has been working that down pitch very well to lefties. There's Michael Lotif, co-head coach, along with his wife, Stephanie Lotif. Michael known for his offensive prowess. A moment ago having a word with Holly Pankersley as she steps into the left-handed batter's box. This should be a good matchup here. Pankersley, the player of the year in the Sun Belt Conference. She starts with the ball outside, 68 miles per hour. You can see it in the upper right-hand corner after every pitch. I'll tell you the mile per hour, and 68 miles per hour is bringing it. Another 68 mile an hour heater, and the count is now one and one. Yeah, it's going to be important for this Raging Cajun team to let their hands be relaxed and be quick so that they don't have uh, too much stress in your hands. When your hands are stressed or too tight, you're going to be slow to the ball. Ball is drilled, but foul. Ollie Tankersley, a batting average of 452. Look at that on base percentage. Five out of every nine times she comes to the plate, she gets on base safely. First team All-American. Only struck out 10 times on the year in 186 at bats. Well, and Eric, that's an amazing statistic for a power hitter to be able to hit for average and only strike out 10 times in over 180 at bats. Really says a lot about the quality of her swing. Nelson looking to strike out the side. Everything we've seen so far in this first inning has been either 68 or 69 miles per hour. Well, Nelson brings the ball hard. When we talked to her coaching staff yesterday, they mentioned she throws a heavy ball. So her, her pitches come in not just with a lot of velocity, but with a lot of rotation and spin. Softly hit on the ground, right side. Papuba over to first in time. Side is retired. Stacy Nelson gets a 1 2 3 first. And now the Florida Gators, they're going to head to the bat rack looking for win number 68 on the year. Welcome back, everyone, to the 2008 Women's College World Series. The Texas AM Aggies, they will play in our second game today. They will take on Angela Tincher and Virginia Tech. First things first, we've got Louisiana Lafayette taking on that man's team. That is Tim Walton, now in his third year with the Florida Gators, and what a season his Gators have had. He was named SEC Coach of the Year after winning 67 of the 70 games that his team played already this season. With one more win, they will set a new Division I record for wins in a season. All right, let's get you introduced to the Gators starting lineup. I'm Kim Walzonia, a junior from Montana, California. and I've played three positions in three years. Hi, I'm Asia Bokoba, a freshman from Wildemar, California, and I never step on the chalk lines. Hi, my name is Allie Gardner. I'm a junior, and my dad was a Gator and played baseball at the University of Florida. I'm Francesca Anea. I'm a sophomore, and I hope to one day join the Peace Corps. Hi, I'm Mary Ratliff, a senior from Mount Sterling, Kentucky, and back home, I live on a farm with horses and cattle and the whole shebang. Hi, I'm Tiffany DeFelice. I'm a freshman from Coral Springs, Florida, and I own over 300 DVDs. Hi, I'm Megan Bush. I'm a freshman from Anaheim Hills, California, and I hit a home run in my first collegiate at bat. I'm Christina Hilberth. I'm a junior from Dunedin, Florida, and I speak Hungarian fluently. I'm Corey Brooks, a sophomore from Christmas, Florida, and I work at a gator farm and wrestle alligators. The Florida Gators are the team batting average of 312. They average 5.7 runs per game, and a big reason why is their cleanup hitter, Francesca Anea. Well, Anea, just a freshman, has really just been a huge boost to this Gator lineup. She's done a lot for these Florida Gators, and uh, she's going to need to have a good World Series to help propel this team to have a chance for the national championship. And they will be going up against a freshman. Ashley Brignac will get the ball here in game one for Louisiana Lafayette. She is a precocious freshman, 30 wins against just six losses, and she has a very quick rise ball. Well, she will throw the ball in the high 60s. She's been clocked at 70 miles an hour. She's got two gold medals with the Junior Olympic U.S. team, World Championships, as well as Junior Pan Ams. She's got quite the record book already. That ball is fair, 
And quickly the catcher Bowers comes out of her stance and throws out Wallazonia. So one pitch one out for the Florida Gators. Take a look at the pitch on the outside corner. It's actually a little bit sweet. Wallazonia gets the ball down but just not enough speed to beat it out. Good job by Bowers behind the plate to pop out and pick up that bunt. Also a good job by the home plate umpire Willie Newman to get in position to see that that ball was still in fair territory. And the out is recorded. This is Asia Pakulba, second baseman. Batting average of 340 on the year. A lot of young players in this lineup for the Florida Gators. Have reason to believe that the actual future is even better than the present, which is hard to believe considering they're 67 and 3. Sixty-four miles per hour misses upstairs. That is now three balls and no strikes. Nice rise ball by Brignac. She's going to need at this stage of the game to figure out what the umpire strike zone is. Very important for young pitchers. Take a look at that offering. Again, up in the zone, but it's a rise ball that she adjusts a little bit. Bring it down. It's very important for young pitchers to realize there's three strike zones. Your strike zone as a pitcher, the umpires, and the batters. The quicker you learn that those strike zones, the more success you'll have during the game. And on five pitches, Brignac walks Pakulba. So good speed aboard at first base. Defensively behind the freshman Brignac in the outfield from left to right. It's Smith, Hubbard, and Tankersley. And a great story in the infield. At the hot corner, playing third base, it's Melissa Verdi. She is playing with a torn ACL. And she's still playing at a high level. Actually, she's probably playing better than when she first tore the ACL back in March. There she is. Just a fantastic bundle of guts she is. Oh, yeah. And, and really playing third base, she's fortunate in the sense that a lot of movement at third is forward and back. When you have a torn ACL, typically forward and backward movement, you have a, um, you have to be very careful. It's that side-to-side -side movement where you, you have to really watch the stabilization of that knee. But I think one of the things that really helped her a lot, Eric, is that she got an ACL brace. And that ACL brace really gave her a lot of confidence to be able, and you can see it on her left leg there, that ACL brace really gave her a lot of confidence to be able to go out and field everything that's being put down to her. Allie Gardner down in the count 0-2. Junior began her college career at University of North Carolina Wilmington, transferred to the Florida Gators, and has enjoyed her time in Gainesville. First team All SEC this spring. Leads the team in batting average at 405, has seven homers. Hits this one hard, past the diving shortstop in a left center field. Solid base hit, first one of the game, and we have runners on at first and at second, just one out here in the home half of the first. Take a look at the pitch on the inside corner, and because the Gardner is so far off the plate, she actually takes its ball and drives it back the opposite way. You can see the way the Raging Cajun defense is set up a little bit. Blasts it past Broadhead, the shortstop. Outstanding hitting by Allie Gardner. And that'll set up Francesca Anea, sophomore from Woodland Hills, California. She takes the first pitch, strike one. That's a good look at Anea. Head coach Tim Walton was thrilled when she decided to matriculate to Gainesville. She's really the first big name recruit that they got out of California to come and play for the Gators. I pop up foul and out of play and she's down in the count 0-2. A lot of great players nowadays in Florida, but you still need to go out of state if you want to compete at the national level and getting a player like Enea has helped Florida make inroads into California. Brignac's 0-2. This is downstairs. Good block by Bowers. All right, Smitty, we're looking at these miles per hour readings in the upper right-hand part of the screen. If that one said 64 miles per hour, we were told that Brignac was bringing it like 66, 67, sometimes 68. And it looks like right now could be nerves. A little, her velocity's down a little bit early in the game. But a lot of times it's not always velocity, it's location. And pitchers 
who can keep the ball on the corner. If you throw anywhere in the mid to high 60s and you can keep the ball on the corners, typically, typically you're going to be pretty successful. It's when you start throwing the ball sweet over the plate that you get yourself in trouble. And it doesn't matter if it's 64 or if it's 70. If you throw the ball down the heart, the quality of these hitters, the level of these hitters, will get all into that ball. Rig next, one, two. Hit hard, but foul. May has had some good swings against Brignac. And the scouting report for Brignac is that being just a freshman, she needs to really cool the nerves early, get out there, get comfortable, and throw the ball hard, but also make it move. Again, we talked that it's not always just about velocity. It's about making the ball move, get it on and off the, on the plate as quick as possible. That one's 67 miles per hour, so maybe she's getting a little bit more comfortable. And it's another foul ball. Last year, Brignac was honored as the Gatorade National High School Player of the Year. She's from River Ridge, Louisiana, just outside of New Orleans, and she was just spectacular during her high school career. Didn't give up a run in either her junior year or senior year. That in itself is an amazing statistic. <laughs> That's a lot of innings pitched to not give up a run. And she chose, couldn't went anywhere in the country. She chose to come to Louisiana Lafayette. What a get for that program. And Ine has not been fooled by much. The harder it comes in, the more she's whacking it fouled on the third base line. Well, and Ine has her toes right on the line. That inside pitch is getting on her very quickly. It's getting those hands thrown out. It's amazing that, that she's able to turn on that pitch. In this situation, if I was in the circle, I'd be looking to throw a little bit of off speed here to try and get Anae out in front of these pitches. More power, and Anae comes up empty. 67 miles per hour. It's the first strikeout for Brignac. They're now two outs here in inning number one. And the difference on this pitch is that it's still coming in hard, but look at the way it actually is low in the zone. The other pitches that Anea was able to foul off were up in the zone. This pitch is actually riding in and a little bit down, and Anea just cannot get her bat on it. Outstanding pitch by Brignac. So that'll leave things up for Mary Ratliff, senior from Mount Sterling, Kentucky. Last hope for the Gators here in the first inning. Pakulba on at second, Gardner on at first. Look at the numbers from Mary Ratliff. Batting average of 305. Nine home runs. No one really for the Gators has just jaw-dropping numbers in that lineup. They all just perform. Outside. And Eric, that's why they're such a good team, because they are consistent. They're, they're not strong one through four and then weak the rest of the way through the lineup. They are consistent one through nine. They consistently pitch well and play defense well. And when you do that as a team, you're going to show up in that number one spot. There's a good strikeout or half count even two and two. Rignac looking for one more strike and an opportunity to get back to that dugout. Brignac, the 2-2, swing and a miss, back-to-back -back strikeouts. She gets Anea and she gets Ratliff to retire the side and the strand two. We played an inning. When we come back, we'll have the second inning. We'll see Melissa Ferdy grab a bat. Remember, she's playing with a torn ACL. How will she do against Stacey Nelson? We'll find out. Two of the things that Oklahoma City is known for, the Bricktown area downtown, and of course, world-class softball, and we're seeing it right here. The Women's College World Series, second inning, scoreless between Louisiana Lafayette and Florida. And it wouldn't be a Women's College World Series without Holly Rowe being here. Let's go down to Holly. What's going on, Holly? Well, thanks, Eric. You know, this Louisiana Lafayette team is known as a hitting team, in large part because of the system that their co-head coach, Michael Lotif, employs. 
since he joined the team, their home run numbers and hitting numbers have been astronomical. Just two years ago, they hit over 100 home runs in the season. Now, the last two years have been down a little bit, but talking to Coach yesterday, he said he has had to employ this hitting system because they don't recruit the kind of kid that can just flick their wrist and hit it over the fence. He said, we're recruiting hitters who have to use all of their body. It's more of a rotational system. You'll see the split grip, the more of an open hip. And he said it's really worked well for their hitters, but this season their numbers may be down because they're so young. 19 freshmen, redshirt freshmen and sophomores on the team they're still learning the system. And Holly, I love his philosophy. He tells his hitters, swing hard in case you hit it. <laughs> you gotta love that. <laughs> Leading things off here in the second inning, it's Melissa Verdi. Told you when she was out defensively at third base that she's got that big brace on her left knee. She's playing with a torn ACL. It's been torn since the middle of March, but that really hasn't affected her much. If anything, she's playing better than she was before the injury. That has all to do with confidence. Again, I think that brace is helping her. And, and Eric, a lot of times, too, we talk about that ACL injury, this instability forward and back. It basically holds that knee together from moving forward. So to be able to play third base and hit and run and still put up the numbers that she has really just is a huge tribute to, to basically what this young lady has gone through. And she was told that she couldn't make anything worse. It's already torn. You can't re-tear it. But if she could stand the pain, she'd be able to play. And she says, Pain's no big deal, and look at the numbers. It bears her out. Five homers in the last 26 games while playing with the damaged knee. I, I really can't explain that. You're, you're the expert. How do you explain how she's playing better since the injury? Well, you know, sometimes when an athlete is injured, they basically mentally, they clear themselves. They almost feel like, all right, I'm injured. I'm probably not supposed to play as well. So their level of expectation is a little bit lower and they go out and play free. When you play free, you play your best. And she works the walk. So the leadoff runner aboard. Let's go back down to Holly. Holly, you have something more? Well, you're wondering how Verde can be doing this with the torn ACL. In large part, it's just due to her toughness. She actually tore the ACL in a game against the US national team. She tore it, got back up, and made the next out. She was only out for a few weeks trying to get the swelling to go down in time to get back and play. And most players would quit in her situation, but not her. And now it's going to be interesting to see what she does in the base pass. I know they don't want her to slide, at least not slide feet first. We'll see if she has to. So Verdi on it first, and this is Lana Bowers, the catcher from Crosby, Texas, who fouls it back to the screen. 68 miles per hour in that pitch from Stacy Nelson. First team all Sun Belt, one of many in that starting lineup for the Raging Cajuns. In total, they have four of their nine voted first team all Sun Belt Conference this year. So maybe we were talking about that split hand approach right there. That ball is smoked, it's gonna be a double play. The second baseman, Pakuba, had her played perfectly and she picks off Verdi, straying too far away from the bag at first. Well, that's a hard play for Verdi. You're going to be aggressive off the bag, anything that's hit that hard. But Pakulba is just in an outstanding position. Look at the pitch on the outside corner. Nice hitting by Bowers, driving that ball the opposite way. Verdi, of course, off the bag hard on a nice line shot. But Pakulba making a very good defensive play for Florida. Pakulba, first team all defensive team in the SEC. This ball is looped into left field. It's going to be easy play for Francesca Enea. She makes the catch and the side retired. So Stacy Nelson pitches around the leadoff walk. The double play helps her out. The second, the bottom half, we go. Up with Phil Collins in the air tonight. The song came about when one of our bus drivers loved it and kept repeating it over and over again. I can feel it coming in the air tonight, oh Lord. <laughs> Bill Collins, no relation, in case you're wondering. Alongside Michelle Smith, I'm Eric Collins. We're getting ready for the bottom of the second inning. Florida Gator fans have made the pilgrimage here to Oklahoma City. Trying to get something going here. They had a couple of base runners on in the first inning, but back-to-back -back strikeouts of Anea and Ratliff. What a stem to the, the rally. It'll be Tiffany DeFelice, Megan Bush, and Christina Hilbert, the scheduled three against Ashley Brignac. Florida 
the Gators, looking for their 68th win of the year. That would be a new NCAA record. 67-3 so far this year, which is just unbelievable when you think about it. In case you're wondering, those three teams that actually defeated them, Long Beach State, Alabama during SEC play, and then they're in the regional round, they lost against Central Florida. That's it, though, 70 games. And Central Florida had a very good year this year. They also played against the U.S. Olympic team and played the U.S. Olympic team very hard. So uh, this Gator team had a had a decent schedule. And 67 wins, no matter what your competition is, is amazing. Florida Gators winning the SEC regular season, also winning the SEC tournament. One other team from the SEC is in this year's Women's College World Series. That's the Alabama Crimson Tide. One, two pitches, laced foul. I know you were impressed when we talked to Tim Walton yesterday, the head coach for the Florida Gators. Just his third season, but he's been around winning programs really all his adult life. Well, Tim Walton really has a great history with the game, was an amazing baseball player himself for the University of Oklahoma, was on the University of Oklahoma softball coaching staff when they won their national championship. Ball is poked into the left center field. That's going to be a solid base hit. DeFelice thinking about going to second. Instead, retreats back to first base. Lead up, batter aboard. The NCAA Women's College World Series continues on ESPN later today. Our second game will be Angela Tincher and the Virginia Tech Hokies taking on the Texas A&M Aggies. The NCAA Women's College World Series presented on ESPN by Dick Sporting Goods on ESPN today at 3 Eastern time after this first game. Good confidence boost for Tiffany DeFelice on at first base. That's her first base hit of this year's postseason. So the runner on at first, this is Megan Bush, freshman shortstop. Foul tip at home plate. And this is an interesting case for the University of Florida. We're talking about Tim Walton and basically the history he's had with the, the coaching staffs he's been a member of. And here we have early in the game, and no uh, one runner on, no outs, and he's choosing so far not to bunt Megan Bush or move his players into scoring position. That shows how much faith he has in his hitters. One one pitch, swung on and missed. One and two. And you know, a lot of times, Eric, you know, you, you automatically think nobody out, runner on first, you're going to bunt him. But even at times when there's not a lot of speed. It, at first, and we'll take a look at this pitch real quick. It's a rise ball. Look at the way Brignac gets under that, and boy, Bush just chases that up the ladder. But getting back to the point about the University of Florida is that sometimes in this scenario, you want, might want to go ahead and, and work an and run situation, a bunt and run to give your, uh, your runners an opportunity to get a little bit of a lead, a hit and run, something to move the defense. Very important to try and get the defense moving. You do that, you make your job a little bit easier offensively. Called strike three in her half. That's now three strikeouts for Ashley Brignac, and it's out number one here in the second. And Brignac works, rise, 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 and then she comes in with the screwball. And look at the way this ball's right on the corner, and Bush just frozen, looking for something up the ladder. It's a screwball on the corner. Outstanding pitch, great call in that case. Deepoli still on it first. And now this is the catcher, Christina Hilbert. And Hilbert takes a called strike. Junior from Dunedin, Florida. Has been solid so far in the postseason. For a catcher, she has pretty good speed. Let's see if that's a factor here. Outside one and one. Florida Gators have never reached the Women's College World Series before this year, and now not just making it, but the number one national seed. That's 
going to be a called strike. She went too far. It's now a ball and two strikes. It's very important for these Gator hitters. If they square early, Brignac throwing the great rise ball that she is, they're going to need to learn to pull that back back on anything that's high in the zone. Square a little bit later, you might be able to fool Brignac. She won't be able to adjust that rise ball late in the pitch. Here's the one, two. Slapped and hit softly foul, third base side. Smitty, this may be the only sporting contest, the only sport where the Florida Gators do not have the history of Louisiana Lafayette. Florida Gators have never been to the Women's College World Series. They've never defeated Louisiana Lafayette. Louisiana Lafayette has been here five times now, and they've never lost against the Florida Gators. Normally you think of the Gators coming out of the SEC and so much history and football prowess and basketball prowess. But softball, you got to give the nod to Louisiana Lafayette as this is yet another strikeout. Hilbert goes back to the dugout. That's now four Ks for Brignac. And the Gators, when you talk about this program, it's their first College World Series, and if you look at their record in the NC2A tournament. No SEC team has ever won a national championship. And when you talk about the SEC, it's relatively all young programs. A lot of these schools did not really have softball programs until the mid to late 90s. Still on at first base is Tiffany DeFelice. Good strike call, one and one to the number nine hitter, Corey Brooks, sophomore from Christmas, Florida. I've heard of Santa Claus, Indiana. Never been there, heard of it. But until this week, Christmas, Florida was new to me. Heard of Christmas, Florida. I've had a couple of kids come to my uh, holiday camp or my summer camp from Christmas, Florida. It always kind of raises the curiosity. Where's Christmas, Florida? So holiday camps, kids come for Christmas. That's exactly right. Okay. And we're natural. <laughs> Are they all named Mary? You never know. You never know. 2 1 pitch, Brignac to Brooks, lashed foul. It seems like the best swings that Florida's taken have all been hit foul down the third base line. Well, Brignac is throwing that inside pitch very well to right handed hitters, and the Florida batters have been able to get their hands extended. But you're correct, Eric, they're hitting that ball foul. They need to make an adjustment, either move off the plate just a little bit or work on moving that contact point up a little bit further out in front of home plate. Lashed again. This one is going to be fair. DeFelice chugging towards third. The ball is bobbled out in the outfield, and we're going to have a play. No, we won't. It's going to be safe at home plate. Is DeFelice scoring the game's first run? The left fielder, Katie Smith, had a hard time coming up with the ball in the left field corner. Well, this pitch, you can see, is over the plate just a little bit. Brooks gets her hands extended, but Katie Smith here lets this ball get past her. Very important as an outfielder, you got to cut that ball off and not let it get to the fence or play it off of the fence. One or the other, DeFelice running all the way from first base with two outs. She's gone on the hit. Florida gets a good break on a ball down the line. They scored a double, but I'm sure that Katie Smith is going to say that she probably should have cut that off. Probably should be runners at second and third, but instead, because of the misplay out in left field, the first run of the game scores. Yeah, and Eric, it's very important that if you cannot cut off that ball and you know that right away, now you've got to play it off the fence. You know it's going to hit the fence. It's been hit hard. So then you play it off the fence. You come up, you hit your cut man for the opportunity to have a play at home plate. Now, granted, if there's nobody on in two outs, then yeah, maybe you're trying to cut that off to keep the runner at second and potentially um, not allow her to get to third. But with a runner on first base, you've got to be thinking all right, there's going to be a plate at home. How do I put myself in position to be able to hit my cut man for the play at home? So now we'll go back to the top of the lineup and Kim Wallazonia. She bounced out to the catcher her first time up. Got laid out a bunt. Atlanta Bowers is all over it.
Lyle back onto the roof behind home plate. Alizonia, first team, all SEC. Just a junior. Last year she began the year as purely a slap hitter. This year swinging away more. She's done it effectively. She's got three home runs to her credit. Pitch outside one and one. Rignac with 46 pitches through an inning and two thirds. It's pitch count a factor with her. Pitch count's always a factor. It doesn't matter what pitcher is in the circle. Now, granted, these pitchers, it doesn't matter if they have to throw 100 pitches or 200 pitches, but most of these coaches are going to get them through the game uh, with their aces in the circle. But yeah, absolutely, because the batters get to see every one of those pitches that the pitcher throws. And the more a batter can see, the better they're going to be able to adjust. And right now, these Florida hitters are adjusting. They're moving in the box, depending on what Brignac is throwing. Wallazonia stays alive. Tim Walton thrilled this team off to an early 1-0 lead. As you'd imagine, a team with 67 wins and just three losses, they haven't played from behind too frequently. So it's always good for the confidence to get on top early. It's always easy for a, easier for a pitcher to throw with the lead. Called strike three. So three strikeouts for Ashley Brignac. But what happened in between was what she'd like to have back. Tiffany DeFelice scoring all the way from first base on this double down the left field line by Corey Brooks, the number nine hitter coming through for the Florida Gators as we move to the third, one nothing Florida. They one nothing lead for the number one overall seed, the Florida Gators. They lead Louisiana Lafayette one nothing. They had the game's only three hits. Louisiana Lafayette, we told you they're known for their hitting, but Michelle Smith, sometimes they hit differently than other teams. Well, that's right, Eric. One of the things that you're going to see these Raging Cajuns do is actually have a split grip. And when they have a split grip, they're going to be able to hit the high ball very well because it makes your top hand stronger through the zone. What it will hinder, possibly, though, is the low pitch. They're going to need to make some adjustments to be able to go down and get that Stacy Nelson low pitch and work on putting it into the field of play. So it'll be interesting to see how both these teams adjust throughout this game. Yeah, that split grip. Remember Ty Cobb, back in the turn of the century, he was known for having that split grip. Every once in a while, you see it in softball, but you see it a lot on teams coached by Michael Lotif. Playing from behind for the first time, the Raging Cajuns. It'll be seven, eight, and nine. Broadhead, Hubbard, and Katie Smith against Stacy Nelson. Louisiana Lafayette, they've had just one base runner. Lead off walk to Melissa Verdi in the second, but she was doubled off on a line drive out off the bat of Lana Bowers. Take a look at this ball. Just barely foul. It's very important if you're a third baseman and a ball tips off your glove, you cannot wait to hear what the umpire is calling that. That foul ball, fair foul. You, once it tips off your glove, you got to go get it in case that umpire calls that a fair ball. Are you okay positioning your third baseman that close to the line where you're basically able to field balls that are in foul territory? What's the point? Well, depending upon where the pitch is being located, you're going to adjust your positioning as one of the corners. So on inside pitches, you've got to be ready that's ready for something potentially that could be ripped down the line. On an outside pitch, more than likely, if it's hit your way, it's going to be into the 5-6 hole or correct hitting on an outside pitch. Obviously, we want to try and drive that ball into the opposite field. Third bait umpire, that's Michael Bartling going back to his position. Home plate umpires, Willie Newman. Linda Hoover is the umpire down the first baseline. We'll have three person crews, all World Series long. Softly hit to short. Across the diamond, Bush over to Gardner, out number one. Defensively, Florida Gators. They are unrivaled in the country. Team fielding percentage on the year, 
971. Pretty darn good. I shouldn't say unrivaled. There are other teams slightly better. But 971, you're going to win a lot of games when you, you pick it as well as they do. Yeah, when you have a pitching staff like the Gators have and then a defense behind that strong staff, it absolutely makes it easier to win ball games when you're keeping your opponents off the bases. This is Carly Hubbard, the batter. She hits it again to the shortstop. Bush across the diamond in time. Bang, bang, play, and they just get Hubbard at first. Hubbard got down the line in a hurry. And Hubbard runs very well. The key on that play is that Megan Bush gets the ball and gets rid of it. Take a look at this ball. It's hit down. Hubbard does a great job of really using the hard dirt here in Oklahoma City. Bush gets rid of the ball. A tight play could go either way, but a nice stretch by Gardner at first. Very important for that first baseman to get out there, show some effort on a stretch. That'll help the umpire punch out that runner. There's your first baseman, Gardner, with a good stretch. And she gets the call. Two round ball outs to the shortstop, Megan Bush, here in the third inning. Number nine hitter, Katie Smith, takes outside. Two balls, no strikes. Just a freshman from Ruston, Louisiana. About three and a half hours up the road from Lafayette. Ruston is where Louisiana Tech is located. There's a strike. All right, we're talking so much about the Raging Cajuns' history in this Women's College World Series. If it doesn't sound familiar to you, it's maybe it's because they used to be called Southwestern Louisiana. Back then, they were coached by Yvette Girard back in the 1990s, winning a lot of games. Had fantastic pitching back in those days. They've just been called Louisiana Lafayette since the 2000 year. Best finish coming back in 1993, their first time ever at the Women's College World Series. That was under Yvette Girard. 93, they were eliminated actually by your former Olympic teammate, Lisa Fernandez and UCLA. Little chopper, it's going to be a hard play. First base hit of the game. For the Louisiana Lafayette Raging Cajuns, and it comes from the number nine hitter, Katie Smith. Katie Smith, a lot of wheels, puts a nice high chopper down and wheels it out down the line. Look at the way she chokes up. She knows immediately that she's slapping. She chokes up, lets that bat slide down. There's no opportunity for Brooks to get the speedy Smith at first. So the lineup swings around. This is Valley Gaspar batting for the second time. She takes outside. Gaspar struck out to begin the game. Cajuns making adjustments. You see a lot of them are moving their hands. Look how choked up they are. It's one, things, one of the things that Michael Latif talks about with his kids. He wants them to adjust. He teaches his strategy, but he wants them from pitch to pitch to be able to adjust to what the pitcher is throwing them. 1-1 one, one pitch on the ground towards third. Brooks across the diamond in time. And Gaspar is retired. So, no runs, a hit, one runner left on. So far through two and a half, the Florida Gators on top, one to nothing. This is the first of four games coming your way on ESPN all day long. Texas A&M against Virginia Tech. That'll be our second game today. This evening, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to have Alabama against Arizona State, Arizona against UCLA. What a nightcap that'll be. Combined, Arizona and UCLA, eight national championships between those two schools. I'm sorry, 18. My math was way wrong. We got a digit there. 18 national titles, eight for the Arizona Wildcats, 10 for the UCLA Bruins. It'll be Pakulba, Gardner, and Anea. 
scheduled to hit here in the third inning against Ashley Brignac. Already a 1-0 lead for Florida. Smitty, we talked at the beginning of the game about how all eight of these teams really feel like they are the team to beat. Different levels of confidence with everyone in this year's field. Which team do you think has got a, a real chance to make it make something happen over the next five days? Well, I think that this Florida team is very well rounded. The only thing they're lacking is the experience of playing here at the Women's College World Series. You look at perennial powerhouses, Arizona and the University of California, Los Angeles, both those programs, I mean, you can't say enough about them. Alabama also very strong. And then you know what? When you look at Texas A&M and Virginia, both very good, excuse me, Virginia Tech, you look at both those programs, outstanding when you have an Angela Tincture in the circle. If she gets hot for a week, well, we saw it last year with Taryn Mowat. She just mowed through everybody and won herself a national championship. So I, I do have to say I like Florida if they can get past not having the experience of ever, ever having played here before. Pakulba strikes out to lead things off in the bottom of the third inning. It's now strikeout number six for Brignac. Just some of the things that we'll be keeping an eye on over the next week. Arizona trying to win three consecutive national titles. They'd be only the second team to do so. Of course, the number one national seed, the Florida Gators, trying to become the first SEC team to ever win a national title. And UCLA, after not making it last year, which was just a huge story in itself, trying to get that pride back to Westwood. Well, one of the things about that UCLA program is that the seniors in this current class if they do not win a national championship this year, they will be one of, I think, only the one of the only classes to never have won a national championship while at UCLA. They got to the championship series their freshman year, and as you said, Eric, they did not make it back last year. Last opportunity for them to try to earn a ring. UCLA losing against Michigan in 2005. In 2004, they did win it. That team led by Andrea Duran, among others. One down here in the bottom of the third inning. This is Allie Gardner. First team all SEC. She's single back in the first. Rignac looking for her seventh strikeout. And Gardner just stays alive. Just one last thought about what we're expecting to see over the next week. I think any team having to beat Virginia Tech twice, that's tough to do. Angela Tincher. I think everyone's going to admit that maybe starting lineup one through nine for Virginia Tech not on par with the other seven teams here, but the great equalizer, Angela Tincher, and what she can do in that circle. Angela Tincher, she gets hot, and she's going to be tough to hit. And uh, I mean, she's tough to hit even when she's having an off day. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But her experience, and I think that this Virginia Tech team has a lot of confidence playing on this field. This is where they beat the U.S. Olympic team. Rig next, 2-2. Two -two. Outside, three and two. The youngster Brignac so far has struck out six through two innings and a third. So she's recorded seven outs, and six of those outs have come via the strikeout. She did give up that earned run, though, back in the second. Here's the payoff. And that's the second walk issued by Brignac. All right, let's get a little bit more on this freshman pitcher, Brignac. Let's go down to Holly. Holly? Larry, it is important to remember how young she is. She's a true freshman, her first year of pitching at Division I level. We talked to her yesterday about whether she would be nervous or not, and she said, you know, I feel like on this stage, age doesn't matter. It's all about your heart and how you fight. I even spoke to her dad, Joe, before the game. He said, you know, I'm not nervous. She's not nervous, but she has given up two walks, six strikeouts. Uh, so far, the freshman looks pretty good. Oh, that's right, Holly. She looks great. And Stephanie Latif, the co-head coach of this Raging Cajun program, has been around and, and seen and worked with Ashley Brignac since she was 14 years old. And, and she describes her as a bulldog. You put her in a pressure situation, and she's going to come at you. And you cannot ask for any more than that from your pitcher, more or less your freshman pitcher. We're going to have a pinch runner on at first. This is Amy Austin, freshman from Ormond Beach, Florida. She comes on to run for Allie Gardner. Gardner will come back on defensively when we play the fourth inning. With the substitution allowed here in this Women's College World Series. You can get a lot of different players into the game. Francesca Anea struck out back in the first inning. Oh. 
Hit hard over the third baseman's head. Solid single for Anaya. So again, two runners on for the Florida Gators. They've had at least two base runners in each of the first three innings. You take a look at Anaya, and she gets an inside pitch. She's aggressive. She goes right at it. And take a look at the adjustment she makes. She drives this ball, uses the hard ground, the hard play here in Oklahoma City, gets it to bounce over Verdi's head, the third baseman for the Cajuns. This Florida team, so far, I'm impressed with the adjustments they're making offensively. So runners on at first and at second, one out. Let's see what Mary Ratliff is up to. She's got decent power with nine homers on the year. Takes a good strike, outer half, 0-1. On at second base is the pinch runner, Austin. Anaya on at first. High pop-up. That's going to make it into the grandstands. Tim Walton trying to guide the Gators to their first ever win. In the Women's College World Series. Should they get it? It'll be the all-time record for wins in a season by an NCAA team. Rignack would love a strikeout here. And she gets it. Somewhat of a late call, but she gets the strikeout out her half. Willie Newman punches out Ratliff. That's now two Ks and two at-bats for Ratliff. And now Brignac is just one out away from getting the raging Cajuns back into that dugout. Well, some of the adjustments this Florida team is making is moving off the plate because Brignac has done a good job of getting the ball on their hands. Well, when you do that, you still have to make sure you have plate coverage and can reach the outside pitch. So when Brignac comes in, make the adjustment, move back off the plate, but make sure you can get your hands extended, plate coverage, and get that outside pitch to drive it the opposite way. Tiffany DeVelise grabs the bat, trying to keep the inning alive. She singled and scored from first on the double by Corey Brooks back in the second. downstairs. Smitty, just looking at the numbers here so far. Florida, seven batters have struck out, but Brignac has allowed five batters to put the ball in play. Of those five batters, four of them have gotten hits. Yeah, and we've had quite a few strikeouts for Florida looking. They need to be aggressive and know that the ball, if it's around the plate, they need to go get it, especially with two strikes. When they've hit the ball, they've hit it hard. Yes, they have. They've got their hands extended, and they've, they've gone, and they've made some adjustments. And it's the College World Series. You're not going to score runs by keeping the bat on your shoulder. If that pitch is around the plate, you got to go throw your hands at it. Two balls and a strike. Rick Knack trying to work around a, a walk and a single already this frame. And that pitch is off the mark. It's now 3-1 and one to DeFelice. Winner of this game will advance and take on the winner of Texas A&M, Virginia Tech, in a game that will be played tomorrow evening. And on five pitches, DeFelice works the walk. Third walk of the game for Brignac, and the bases are now full. Take a look at the pitch. It's a screwball. You can see the way that Brignac steps to the outside corner. The pitch cuts back in. You can see that screwball movement moving back into the batter close. But Brignac was hoping to get the third K of the inning on that pitch. With runners at first and at second and a 3-1 count, are you surprised that you would throw the screwball? I think that Brignac's best pitch to righties is keeping that pitch in, really trying to jam it in on their hands, not let them get extended. She's worked the outside corner to righties, but she's not as confident. She throws that pitch away, her curveball, she throws that a little bit 
off the plate, and you can tell she's just not real confident with it. All right, let's take a look at our Coke Zero game track thus far as we play the home half of the third inning. It's a one nothing lead for the Florida Gators. Run coming on a Corey Brooks double back in the second inning. And Eric, I think what's most impressive about that double right there is that Corey Brooks made some outstanding adjustments during that at bat to get that ball down the line. This is Megan Bush batting. Brigneck all of a sudden can't find the strike zone. Five of her last six pitches have been off the mark. There's a strike, one and one. And Brignac really working that screwball. If I'm Florida right now, that's the pitch I'm looking to hit. I'm a little bit surprised that the Cajuns aren't working. Brignac's off-speed pitch or rise ball a little bit more. When you allow a hitter to look in one spot, their chances of success increase dramatically. Freshman against freshman here. Downstairs, two and one. What's the thinking here if you're Tim Walton and you know you have your freshman up there. What does Tim Walton want Megan Bush to be thinking about with a 2-1 count? No, oh, any pitch that's, that's close to the plate, you got to be aggressive and you have to go get it. I mean, the batter is in control. Takes an aggressive swing and fouls it off her thigh. It's a dead ball. Runners have to go back to their bases. That ball was hit off of Bush. Of course, she was still in the batter's box, so no harm done except for to her, to her thigh. Take a look at the pitch. It actually looks like it's a screw ball that gets up or a rise ball that Bush just gets a little over rotated on. Ooh. And you can see she takes it right off of that knee. Ow, that never feels good. This is the 27th pitch of the inning for Brignac. Trying to put away Bush. Wants to get her here on 2 2. Pop up behind home plate. That'll make it to the screen. From what we've seen so far of Brignac, 2-2 pitch where she wants to throw a strike. She doesn't want to go 3-2. What should be her pitch here on 2-2? Two two? Well, with Bush being a right-handed batter, we've seen her work that screwball in, in, in. I wouldn't, in this count, I wouldn't be afraid to throw an off-speed pitch or throw a rise ball. That ball is hammered but fouled. She went with a 65-mile-an-hour rise ball. And it's foul out of play. Tim Walton's telling his kids to choke up, make adjustments from pitch to pitch. He knows that Brignac has been throwing the ball inside to righty. So he wants his kids to choke up. When you choke up and shorten up on that bat, what it allows you to do is get the heart or the sweet part of the bat onto an inside pitch a little bit earlier. You do that, you're going to drive the ball harder. Swing and a, I think the it's a foul ball. You heard the home plate umpire, Willie Newman, say that ball actually hit the bat. Maybe it hit her hand when it was on the bat and she was in the process of swinging. Well, a, a pitched ball that a batter swings at. Take a look at this. You can see that it's a full swing. She's coming in. She's not checking. It's a full swing. She fouls it off, and it hits the bottom or the right part of her out elbow. See the way this pitch comes in. I think one of the things you're seeing is that these Florida hitters on that screwball are kind of diving over. They need to keep their bodies upright and allow their hands to get extended. When you're over the plate, it's very easy for a pitcher to throw in under your hands. You've got to stay upright so that the pitcher cannot throw under your hands. That was a great call by Willie Newman to see that. All right, 2 2 pitch. Fouled back to the screen. I think sometimes when you're an umpire, not only have to go with what you see, you have to go with what you hear. Pretty sure that the home plate umpire just heard the thud against the elbow. You take a look at the numbers for Ashley Brignac. Already 80 pitches. There are two other very good pitchers, highly thought of pitchers, on this Raging Cajun staff. Maybe we'll see them sooner rather than later. All right, base is loaded. And Brignac steps away. Base hit, sandwiched by two walks. And we have a bases loaded situation with two outs. 2-2 two -two pitch, called strike three. Three strikeouts in the inning for Brignac, 
all of them of the looking variety. The Florida Gators leave the bases full. Gorgeous pitch, Brignac catches the outside part of the plate. She now has eight strikeouts in three innings. We'll take a timeout when we come back. We will talk to the head man for the Florida Gators, Tim Walton. We'll get his feelings on what has made his team tick. Thank you so much. Fourth inning action here in Oklahoma City. Game one of what will be four today. And the Raging Cajuns of Louisiana Lafayette, they trail the number one national seed Florida Gators one to nothing. Four hits already for Florida, but just one run. All right, Holly Rowe is standing by with the head coach of Florida, Tim Walton. Well, Coach Walton, you had the bases loaded in that last situation, a freshman at the plate. What were you telling Megan Bush in that situation? Well, we talked about her just going up there and staying short, doing a good job trying to put the ball in play. Uh, you know, obviously, a couple pitches in there. She's, you know, inside pitches are coming at her, so she's trying to fight, and they set her up pretty well in that last pitch right there on the outside corner. So just talked about her about fighting and just going out there and having fun. That last inning, Louisiana Lafayette started getting some contact on Stacy. What adjustment does she need to make? Well, I don't think she really needs to make an adjustment until they until they do something a little different. They're those kids that got on base, they're great little slappers, do a good job finding the top half of the ball, and she throws the pitches, you know, screw ball, drop ball, and they, they just did a great job of staying controlling on top of it. All right, thanks, Coach. Thanks. Holly, thank you so much. Tim Walt, just a fixture at World Series, both of the, the men's variety and the women's variety. He was the winning pitcher in the uh, winning the World Series 1994 while pitching for the Oklahoma Sooners. That was in his baseball days. Moving over to the softball world in 2000, he was on Patty Gasso's staff when they won the Women's College World Series here in Oklahoma City behind the, the pitching of Jennifer Stewart and the hitting of Lisa Carey. Now doing it on his own as the head man of the Florida Gators. And his job is fairly easier than it could be when you got someone like Stacy Nelson throwing the way that she does. Well, Stacy Nelson, just a junior, has just been an anchor for this Florida program. But the thing that is impressive about this Florida team is they're strong in all areas of the game. And that is what makes a great team. Not a bunch of superstars, just a great all-around team. Vanessa Soto leads things off. And Eric, when we talked about the Cajuns and the split grip and the adjustments that Florida's making, the adjustments that the Cajuns are going to need to make, you can see this is the split grip that I'm talking about with the Raging Cajuns. It's going to be very difficult, though, to hit a down ball. And Stacy Nelson in this Florida team knows that. So if I'm the Cajuns right now, I'm going to look at making an adjustment, slide those hands together, look for something down in the zone that I can get my hands extended on. Short to, long through. Short to the ball, long follow through. Pitch misses outside, two and two. Stacy Nelson, the SEC Pitcher of the Year, working against Louisiana Lafayette. Slowly hit underneath the first baseman's glove and into right field. Let's see how they're going to rule that one. Any way you slice it, it's going to be the leadoff runner aboard. So Soto on at first base, and here comes the Thunder. It is indeed going to be ruled a base hit, a single for Soto. That's well, a pitch. It looks like it's a little up in the zone, and Soto just gets her hands extender, but I think Allie Gardner at first base could have had that ball. She gives up on it just a little bit, and it sneaks through to the outfield. So leadoff runner aboard for the second time in four innings for Louisiana Lafayette. Before the pitch, time is called by Holly Tankersley. Timeout is granted by the home plate umpire Willie Newman. Look at the numbers for Tankersley. A batting average of 449, 21 bombs. Team leading 72 runs batted in. Right to the third baseman. And the throw is dropped at the bag. Everyone's going to be safe. Two miscues defensively for the Florida Gators in the first two batters of this inning. Wow, and that's unfortunate for the Gators because they have just been stellar this year on defense. And it, as you mentioned, Eric, two miscues defensively, putting Stacy Nelson now on a hot spot here. Tankersley does not run too well. That should have been a double play. Could have been a very easy. Brooks, nice job of getting this ball. Kuba comes over, and you can see that the, the throw just offline a little bit. But still, as a second baseman, you've got to make that catch. You have to slow up catch that ball and get the first out. Don't worry about the double play. You can see the throw 
just a little bit by Brooks to the inside as a second baseman. Make that adjustment, make the catch, get the first out. That's what is most important. So how about this, a rally for Louisiana Lafayette. We're gonna have a pinch runner coming on at second for Vanessa Soto. It's Courtney Trahan. So Trahan on at second base. It's Tankersley on at first base. Nobody out. And the cleanup hitter, Melissa Verdi, is the batter. What are the options with Melissa Verdi? Do you swing away or do you play small ball? I think you play small ball. You got to move both runners into position. And that's obviously not <laughs> the thinking of the Latifs. But I mean, if you can get runners at second and third, you open up your possibilities of getting that tying run. Now, maybe it's a little different if it's 0-0 or you have the lead. But when you're down by a run, boy, I'd like a runner on third. This ball is looped down the left field line. It's foul. Missed opportunity there for the Raging Cajuns. Now, the other thing you have to consider, Eric, is that it's your number four batter. A lot of number four hitters are not called upon to bunt very often. So if Verdi is not a good bunter, then, yeah, absolutely, you have her hit away. And you try to ask her to hit the ball to the right side. If she can get the ball down to the right side, there's a good chance she'll move both the runners up 60 feet. And remember, Verdi is playing with a torn ACL in her left knee. Now, having said that, the Gators also know that there's a good chance the Cajuns are going to be trying to hit the ball right side. So what do we see Stacy Nelson doing? Working the outside corner. They want to try to force Verde to hit the ball to the right, excuse me, to the left side of the field. Just a whisker inside. Count it's two and two to Verde. It's quite possible with the way that Verde is hobbling a little bit with that torn ACL, a hard ground ball in the infield, and it's a double play. Good possibility they could go second first, take the double play. Off speed pitch misses outside, a little bit low, count is full, three and two. Nelson's payoff to the second baseman, Pakulba. Only get one out, that's at first base. She tried to apply the tag, but she missed Tankersley running by. So runners now on at second and at third. Umpire on the right side of the infield, right on top of that one, Linda Hoover saying the tag was not made. And it's a screwball down and away. Verdi tries to pull this pitch. You can see just, looks like, it's hard to tell if the tag was actually applied on that. I think that there was possibly time for Pakulba to go to short to second. And that ball just fouled down the line. But I think there was possibly a little bit of time for Pakulba to make a nice turn to Bush to short, to Gardner to first to turn that double play. But you have to make that split decision. Take a look at this pitch. Nice call. Runners at second and third. Lana Bowers lined into a double play back in the second. Off the end of the bat, cue shot down the first base side, and now she's set up 0-2. Stacy Nelson trying to pitch around some defensive lapses behind her. Vanessa Soto leading off this inning with a ball hit to the first baseman that Gardner normally is going to make a play on. Ruled a base hit. And then an error by the third baseman, Brooks. Runners at first and second, nobody out. After the force out, after the put out at first, is now second and third. And that pitch just outside. And Eric, one of the things that sets up an inning like this is that the Gators had bases loaded. They had a big scoring opportunity. And Brignac, the freshman pitcher for the Cajuns, they get the strikeouts. So basically, the Florida opportunity to score is squelched. And then you see the Raging Cajuns come out offensively just on fire. How many times have you seen how many times have you seen oh, the Tim momentum Walton. turn back and forth? Tim Walton, I don't think he liked some of those calls a moment ago. He thought that some of those pitches that were called balls were actually strikes. And I'm not sure you're allowed to argue balls and strikes. You're not supposed to argue balls and strikes. It is a, you know, Tim's a passionate guy. If uh, something's on his mind, he's going he's gonna to lay it out there. 
kind of an interesting look here. Look at the left hand for Lana Bowers. Looks like she's getting ready to do some yard work. <laughs> I, I believe that's the glove that you'd wear if you're in the backyard gardening. Yeah, like splitting wood or something. Using splitting a wood. <laughs> <laughs> look at it. Oh, excuse me. Bouncing ball back to the circle. Runners stay on their bases. The play is at first, and Bowers is retired. There are now two outs. So Bowers does not do any yard work. She stays in the infield, and it's a bounce out to the pitcher, Nelson. And Nelson is one out away from getting out of this pickle. Gabby Bridges, freshman. Trying to keep this inning alive. Hits the ball to left field, and it's right in the sights of Anea, and she makes the catch. Runners on it first and at second. Nobody out, but Stacy Nelson gets out of it. It's still a 1-0 lead for the Florida Gators. We'll take a timeout when we come back. We'll talk to Michael Latif, co-head coach for the Raging Cajuns. Fame Stadium in Oklahoma City is the place to be this week. It is the Women's College World Series coming your way on ESPN. Bottom of the fourth inning, the Florida Gators on top of Louisiana Lafayette, one to nothing. Holly Rowe is standing by with the co-head coach for Louisiana Lafayette, Michael Lotif. Holly. Well, Coach Lotif, your batters are finally starting to get some contact on Nelson. What's been the adjustment they've made? Well, I just seeing her, you know, after you see her for a round, and then uh, they see what see what she's got, and they're sharing information together, and they're feeling more comfortable. So we're going to break through. Your pitcher, Ashley Brignac, has been in some binds that last inning. She had bases loaded. What did you go out and say to her in that co coaching timeout? She's been in binds before. She knows how to work her way through it. Just tell her to stay focused, keep and keep believing in herself, and keep trusting her stuff. Don't try to overthrow. She gets in trouble when she overthrows. So we okay. All right. All right, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Holly. All right. We're okay. You heard it from co-head coach Michael Latif, who not only is the co-head coach of the softball program, but also he is a trial lawyer. A lot of different hats right there. A lot of different hats. There's Stephanie Lotif, co-head coaches for the last six years. Lafayette, Louisiana, southwestern part of the state. Just off of I-10, you ever been in those parts? Leading things off, it's a pop-up behind home plate. Onto the roof. It's Christina Hilbert, the catcher. She'll be followed by Corey Brooks. And then the top of the lineup, Kim Wallazonia. Smitty, eight batters have been struck out by Ashley Brignac. Five of them have been struck out looking. What are they doing wrong, these Florida Gator batters, against Lafayette, Louisiana Lafayette? Well, I think that they're fouling off a lot of pitches. And Brignac will work them in, work them in in and low, in and high, and then she'll catch him off guard and punch a ball outside. You have to be prepared. Do your scouting report, know what pitches she's going to throw, and then keep your hands relaxed. A lot of really good hitters will think out, think out, turn on the inside pitch. You cannot be fooled. You know what she's throwing. Let your hands be relaxed, short to the ball. Softly hit third base side. And you know, Eric, a lot of times too, when, when hitters are being punched out, on called third strikes, a lot of times they're thinking too much. They're thinking about the pitch or guessing what's going to come. That pitch doesn't come and they're frozen. Hit the pitch that comes. To the shortstop. Broadhead's going to have to hurry, not in time. Hilbreth beats it out. Leadoff batter on. All right, let's go down in the field where Holly has a, a glove story. Holly? Well, you may have noticed that unusual hitting glove for Lana Bauer just at her last time at the plate. Okay, I'm not kidding. She really did buy this at Home Depot. It's a good old-fashioned leather work glove. I talked to her coaches and said, why in the world would she use that? They said she gets a better grip. It fits her hand a little bit better. And after all, she's a farm girl from East Texas. <laughs> and if she needs to chop wood, she's ready. <laughs> That's right. It does. It looks like the, the gloves my dad used to make me wear when I had to chop wood. Growing up in New Jersey, heat that, heat that house. Oh, wow, that's an interesting story. Thanks, Holly. So runner on at first base in the form of Christina Hilberth, and Corey Brooks is the batter. That's Corey Brooks. I, think, I believe all of that about, I don't know about the fit part, that it, it fits her hand better than a batting glove. Usually batting yeah, gloves are nice and tight. That glove looks like it's blousy. Huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And only one of them. Why not in the other hand, too? Bunt laid down. Plays at second, and they get the force out. 
good aggressive play. And that's out number one. That's the third baseman we've been talking about. Melissa Verdi, very quick defensively, and throwing the strike down to second. Well, there's two things that set up a play like that. Bowers, the catcher, has got to make the call. She does a good job of coming out, and you can see right away that Verdi comes up. She knows she's going to be going to second. No hesitation, no look. Grabs that ball, nice throw down to second, to Broadhead, covering. Good defensive play for the Cajuns. And she did all that without an ACL. Just a very thick race on that left knee. Third time at bat for the center fielder, Kim Wallazonia. First team all SEC. Looking for a first base hit against Brignac. Hits this one to the second baseman. Throw to first is low, but it's in time. Bridges dicks it out of the dirt. There are now two outs. Moving over to second base goes Brooks. The NCAA Women's College World Series continues on ESPN tonight with a double dip. First at 7 Eastern time. It's the Arizona State Sun Devils. Caitlin Cochran can absolutely rake, taking on the Alabama Crimson Tide. Then at 9 Eastern time, two-time defending national champion Arizona taking on perennial power UCLA. The NCAA Women's College World Series presented on ESPN by Dick Sporting Goods. Two down, first pitch is a strike to Asia Pakulba. Hey, with tonight's games, it's almost like we're watching a, a Pac-10 Invitational. Three of the four teams coming from the Pac-10. Arizona, Arizona State, and UCLA. That's some thunder there. Wouldn't it be something if Taryn Mowat threw a, a thousand pitches again and in every inning of every game, just like she did last year in winning the national championship for Arizona? Yeah, she was the energizer bunny last year. And Foul ball back to the screen, a ball and two strikes. This is game one of four today here at Hall of Fame Stadium in Oklahoma City. Louisiana Lafayette making their fifth trip to the Women's College World Series against inaugural participant, the Florida Gators, with Michelle Smith and Holly Rowe. I'm Eric Collins. And another foul ball back. The only run of the game coming back in the home half of the second inning. RBI double off the bat of Corey Brooks scoring. Tiffany DeFelice. Besides that, a bunch of zeros. Ashley Brignac has struck out eight. He is just a freshman with a sensational future. Top foul, and Tim Walton still got it. Good play by Tim Walton down there. Made it look effortless. And I guess his philosophy is act like you've done it before. Made no mind it. Let everyone know that he's still got those good hands. Right. Fake it till you make it. That's what I always tell the young kiddies. This ball is hit high, fairly deep, but foul. Smitty, this Women's College World Series has just grown by leaps and bounds over the years. Uh, this, uh, this stadium here at, in Oklahoma City where Team USA plays, it's ASA Hall of Fame Stadium, is just, you know, as an athlete, to the, the pinnacle to be able to play here. And every year the Women's College World Series that has been here has grown more and more. And we've seen years when the University of Oklahoma has participated in this tournament where the crowds have been phenomenal. And even in years where Oklahoma or Oklahoma State have not made it to this World Series, the crowds, the people still come out, the universities that are actually competing here, the amount of fans that travel with these women, with these clubs is, is just amazing. 2-2 two -two pitch, good eye by Bakulba. And the count now runs full, three and two. Brignac trying to work that rise ball back in to her pitches. Saw her use that earlier in the game. Line drive, fair. Once again, past left fielder Smith. This is going to drive in a run. Coming around to score is Brooks, and it's now a 2 0 lead for the Gators. Well, 
Pakulba gets an inside pitch. It's a screwball. She just drives this pitch down the line. If I'm Katie Smith for the Cajuns, knowing that that screwball is being thrown into righties, I'm going to be moving toward the line a little bit. This ball gets past Katie once again. And even if she would have fielded it, Eric, I don't believe she would have had a play at home. That ball was laced too much with two outs. The runner is gone on contact but still very important to keep that ball in front and not allow it to get to the fence. And now here comes Michael Lotif. He wants to talk things over with his entire infield defense. And make sure that everyone's on the same page. What's this discussion about? Well, I think he's basically Tom Brignac to just keep th throwing her pitches really you know be a bulldog. You can tell he's he's pumping her up saying look believe in yourself. We're going to come back. We're going to get you some runs. But let's gel together. This is important. Another runner in scoring position. Let's try and keep it at two to nothing. Let's not let the score start to get out of hand. All NCAA Women's College World Series games can be caught on ESPN and ESPN 2 HD. For the official results from every NCAA championship, go to NCAA.com, the official online home for all 88 NCAA championships. Number three hitter, Allie Gardner. Steps into the left handed batter's box. She's perfect so far today. A single in the first, walked in the third. Makes a strike, but paints the outside black 0 and 1. season long has feasted in these situations. Batting average of 450 with runners in scoring position. Pop up. That's going to make it into the grandstands. Smitty, we're talking about how great this tournament has been and and all the fans who come and, and the things that people see. To me, what makes this event so great is it's a top step event. Whenever you look into the dugout, each and every game, any inning you're watching, every single person on each team is in the top step of the dugout. And I think that just speaks volumes for how people are in the game. One two pitch popped up, foul again to the screen. And again, that one makes it into the dugout. And you'll see this for the next week, top stepping it. Yeah, the emotion that these women play with is you don't see it very often or in a lot of uh, even professional sports. You see a lot of the guys hanging out, for instance, in baseball, sitting back, relaxing. These women, every pitch of every game will be up cheering, rooting on their teammates. And, uh, you know, and you'll see a lot of tears at the end of the games when things don't go in their team's favor. Rignac looking for that one elusive strike three, and she gets it. Finally, the inning comes to a close, but not before the Gators do more damage. They string together a couple of base hits, the most significant one, a double by Asia Pakulba. Pakulba's doubled on the left field line, scoring the game's second run. It's now inning number five. Welcome back, everyone. The first game of four this afternoon and this evening at ASA Hall of Fame Stadium in Oklahoma City. The number one national seed, the Florida Gators, on top of Louisiana Lafayette, two to nothing. And time now for our fan in the stand. We're going to talk to Vanessa Gutierrez from Farmington, New Mexico. Vanessa, what's on your mind? Um, I was just gonna. I was just wondering that. Um, how can you aim your pitch to hit hit in the right spot that you want it to? Thank you, Vanessa. Now, that's obviously not a question for me. That would be a question for you. Well, I think the biggest thing, Eric, is that it's very important for young pitchers to realize that their hip angle has to be correct. In order for you to get the ball to the target, your hips have to be at a 45 to 52 degree angle. If your hip is in the way, your arm's going to bump your hip. You're not going to hit your target. Keep your hip at the correct angle, 45 to 52 degrees. That'll allow your arm to swing through and throw a nice strike right to home plate. By what age should you be throwing quality strikes a good majority of the time? Well, the majority of the time, you really want to be throwing pitches that are hitting the corner, not down the middle. So for young kids, we want to have fastballs. We want to throw fastballs. Thank you, Vanessa Gutierrez. I like that question. I like this whole fan in the stands thing. All right, leading things off, 
It's going to be a bounce out to the shortstop. Ball is hit well off the bat of Brooke Broadhead. But one shortstop grounds out to the other one. Megan Bush makes the play. Stacy Nelson, 45 wins, just three losses on the year. Looking good right here as we play the top of the fifth inning. She has just two strikeouts, those coming with the first two batters of the game. Another ball put into play. It's going to be a tough play. And safe at first base is Carly Hubbard. Hubbard beats it out. That's just the second base hit. Make that the third base hit allowed by Stacy Nelson. And with one out, a runner out of first. Well, the Cajuns once again using this hard ground, pound that ball down. Hubbard puts it down hard and is off to the races. Nice play by Brooks. And you can see it is a bang, bang play. It looks like that ball and the runner are getting there at the same time. That is a tough call. And when I say it's a tough call, I wouldn't want to be the blue in that case. That's a, that's a bang, bang call. So runner on at first base, one out. Katie Smith, not your typical number nine hitter with that 381 batting average. She had a single back in the third inning. Time, that was the first base hit for Louisiana Lafayette. Smitty, looking at my scorecard here, the first two batters of the game struck out against Stacy Nelson. Ever since, everyone's put the bat on the ball, yet they haven't scored a run. Does that mean it's only a matter of time? Well, Stacy Nelson is tough. I mean, you're seeing the Cajuns beat the ball down into the ground a lot. So I, I think they're still full. They are making adjustments. We've talked about their split grips and the different things that uh, the coaching staff for the Cajuns have them doing. But no, I think the, these Cajuns are still a little bit off balance. They're going to have to work a little bit harder to get their hands extended on a Stacy Nelson offering and drive it in to play. Get me over gets over, and it's now three and one. Just two fly ball outs against Stacy Nelson. Both of those off the bat of Gabby Bridges. Everyone else has either struck out or put the ball on the ground. 3-1 fouled at home plate off the catcher Hilbert. And we talk a lot from a pitcher's perspective, but being a hitter myself as well, it's important to realize that when a good pitcher is throwing you hard and down in the zone, sometimes you need to make adjustments a little bit lower crouch. So you might want to have a little bit more bend at the waist, a little bit more bend at the knees, and then extend your hands, get your hands out in front, short to the ball, and drive it into the green. Called strike three. Hubbard strikes out. Snap throw over to first base. And Hubbard back to the bag. I'm sorry, that's Katie Smith who just struck out. Just the third strike out of the game for Nelson. So good job, Nelson was down in the count, three balls, no strikes, and comes back and strikes out Katie Smith. Now the top of the lineup, and Valley Gaspar takes a strike. And Gaspar a slapper. Be looking to do something with the ball, drive it down. Hubbard runs well at first base. She's stolen 15 bags and 16 tries. That she's been anchored to first so far. And one, and and that's a great point, Eric, because one of the things that you're going to see is Florida, their defense set up because it is a slapper up. Their defense or middle infielders are going to be short. That gives Hubbard an opportunity to potentially run. And as you mentioned, she does run well. So it'll be interesting to see here if the Cajuns are aggressive and try to move Hubbard in the scoring position. Not running on an 0-2 pitch. And it's a ball. A ball and two strikes. Now, one of the things that Florida has done very well to try to keep Hubbard close to first is that Hilbreth, you saw her throw down to first, try and pick her off. When you have a catcher that throws down to first, it's hard to take aggressive leads at first base. Little chopper, no man's land, and everyone's going to be safe. The shortstop Bush came on, tried to short hop it, and the ball spins away from her. It would have been a tough play anyway. And a semi-rally for the Raging Cajuns. Again, the Cajuns are working this hard ground. I think Bush, even if she would have come up with that ball, might not have had a chance to get Gaspar, who runs very well. But what you want to do as a middle infielder, if you can field that ball, you can come back around, 
fake to first, come back and try and get the lead runner who's turning at second base and try and pick her off. So very important to try and get that ball in your glove, even if you don't have to play it first. And now an opportunity to be a hero. Vanessa Soto, senior from San Diego, played her first three years at LSU. Decided to matriculate down to Lafayette for her senior season has had a heck of a senior season. First team all Sun Belt. There's a strike, change up, evens the count of the ball and a strike. Well, Stacy Nelson is tough. She works hard and heavy down in the zone, and when she throws an off speed, you can tell that these Cajun hitters are really perplexed by that pitch. Outside, two and one. Texas A&M, they will play our second game today against Virginia Tech. Texas A&M, they were two losses and out of here last year, coming in with high hopes. Chopped at the dirt. Foul, two balls and two strikes. Soto just trying to get on base, because in the on-deck circle, looming is the Sun Belt Player of the Year, Holly Tankersley. Base side foul. What would be the, the strikeout pitch here for Stacy Nelson against Soda? Well, we've seen Nelson work down her screwball and then down her drop ball hard, but I think if she threw another changeup, I think that she'd probably get Soto looking. And Soto pops this one deep to center field, off the base of the wall. One run will score. Two runs will score. And we're tied. An inning ago, Michael Lotif, the co-head coach for the Raging Cajun, said, don't worry, we're good. And he knew something. He knew something. Two run score on the double by Soto. Well, Soto's still with that split grip. You can see that pitch. It's on the corner, but look at the height of it. It is just above the knees, and Soto drives this ball while Zonia, the center fielder for Florida, is way in. And Soto drives that ball deep to the fence. Tankersley swings to the first pitch and grounds out to the second baseman. Side retired, but not before major damage is done. Vanessa Soto, a two out, two strike, two run double. And now we're tied at two. Vanessa Soto, the star at least of this top half of the fifth inning, a two run double, tying the game at two against the number one national seed, Florida Gators. Three hits in the inning, the biggest blow coming off the Seniors bat from San Diego. Soto now with 67 runs batted in on the year. None bigger than those two to keep her team in it. But it'll be the intimidating part of the lineup for the Florida Gators. Batting against Michael Lotif's Louisiana Lafayette Raging Cajuns. It'll be four, five, and six for the Gators. Francesca Enea, Mary Ratliff, and Tiffany DeFelice, the scheduled three. Here is Francesca Enea. Alongside Michelle Smith, I'm Eric Collins. This is the first of four games today. Opening round action of the Women's College World Series. There is Angela Tincher looming large here in Oklahoma City. Two months ago, she no hit the U.S. national team on this very field. It's the first time the Hokies had ever played at Hall of Fame Stadium. And a no hitter by Tincher made them winners. Francesca Enea, single her last time up. One of six hits for the Gators. Florida 67 and three on the season. Against Louisiana Lafayette, the champions of the Sun Belt Conference. And Enea chases the pitch well out of the zone. That's now 10 strikeouts for Brignac. Let's go down field side and talk to Holly Rowe. Holly. Well, Vanessa 
Alexis Soto coming up huge for Louisiana Lafayette. She's a transfer. This is the only year she's played for the Raging Cajuns. After her scholarship wasn't renewed at the Louisiana State, she said, I really mourned. I thought my softball career was over. I went through a major grieving period. But then this opportunity opened up, and she said, I can't believe how they accepted me. For me to transfer to a hated rival school and be accepted with open arms has been huge. And, boy, they're glad they accepted her now after that bomb, didn't they? Exactly, Holly. And one of the things that you realize and when you talk to this Cajun team is that when they beat LSU in the regionals to move on to the Super Regionals, their coaching staff said, you know what, even if we would have never made it to the College World Series, our program and the people supporting our university were happy because we beat LSU. That's the type of rivalry between those two schools. Now when we talked to Vanessa Soto, it was bittersweet when her team, the Raging Cajuns, knocked out LSU in the regional round because she obviously had so many good friends still playing for LSU. But one team season had to end, the other one had to continue, and I'm sure she's thrilled that she's still playing. Mary Ratliff is the batter. She struck out each of her first two times against Brignac. Wise ball misses upstairs, three and one. Take a look at the season statistics for Soto. She bats 320, which is outstanding. But then you look at her postseason, 425, stepping it up in her senior campaign. Just been a huge spark plug all the way around, but especially in this postseason for the Raging Cajuns. Four of her nine home runs coming in either the regionals or the super regionals. And on five pitches, Mary Ratliff works the walk. So with one out, a runner on at first base. That is now four walks issued by Ashley Brignac. Talk about Brignac's performance. What do you think so far, the freshman? I think she's doing outstanding so far. She's working the ball on the corner. She's given up a couple of big doubles. Her, her pitch count is a little bit elevated. It's a little higher than you'd like to see. Look at that, 111 pitches already here in just the fifth inning. You'd like to see that be an eight inning game pitch count. But Florida has done a very good job of fouling off pitches. Another thing to consider. A power pitcher or strikeout pitcher, you're always going to throw a lot more pitches than a, than a pitcher that pr potentially will get a lot of ground outs or pop-ups. Tiffany DeFelice has been aboard both times. Singled and scored in the second, walked and was stranded in the third. Strikeout or half, 0-2. Remember, this is a seven-inning game. And Ashley Brignac working here in the fifth inning. She needs get through a couple more innings. If she happens to sputter, they do have good alternatives behind her. Young pitchers as well, but very good arms who are highly thought of at Louisiana Lafayette. Dee Felice fouls that one away. Another good arm that has played fantastically this year for the Raging Cajuns, Donna Bourgeois, just a freshman from in Lafayette. She has put up good numbers. And a little bit different style pitcher, Brittany Cuevas, sophomore, but also, she has done good things for Stephanie Lotif, her husband Michael Lotif, and the Raging Cajuns here in 2008. Actually called them the Killer Bees, Brignac Bourgeois, Brittany Cuevas. Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the reasons I think that this Raging Cajun team has done so well through the postseason, beating a, a team ranked higher than them in LSU to get out of regionals, beating a higher ranked team than them in Houston in Super Regionals to get here to the Women's College World Series is because they do have that strong but young pitching staff. 0-2 pitch to Deep Felice. High pop up third base side. That pitch 64 miles per hour. Nothing but a foul ball. Brignac began the game throwing 64, 65 every once in a while. She got it up in the second inning, 67, 68. But for the most part, this entire game, she's throwing at 64 miles per hour. Stacy Nelson from Florida has been a little bit quicker. On the inside part of the plate, yet another looking strike three. It's 11 strikeouts on the game. Six of them have been looking. Brignac, you can see she steps off to the side. That ball cuts back in. Take a look at this pitch, the way it's going to cut back in. That's her screwball that she's been using. And when Brignac has that pitch moving, it is very, very difficult. 
this is basically what it is. If, if you're throwing from the softball distance of 43 feet and you're throwing at 65 miles per hour, that's 91 miles per hour if this were a men's baseball game and you're throwing from 60 feet 6 inches. So when you keep seeing those radar readings of 65 miles per hour, that's really what you're looking at in the baseball equivalent. Now the pitch gets on you very quickly and then when you have a pitcher who can mimic speeds or make that ball drop rise which you don't see in baseball you don't see a pitch that really moves up through the zone. It can be very difficult to hit. And what we're going to see this evening when Taryn Mowat is throwing for Arizona she's got that Bugs Bunny changeup that comes in at about 43 miles per hour along with that steamer that she brings in at about 66 miles per hour. That's a massive difference. It is a massive difference. You typically want your your changeup or off speed pitch to be somewhere about 25 to 30 percent slower than your hardest pitches. Foul ball into the grandstands. Ball and two strikes. Megan Bush is the batter trying to keep this inning alive. We're in Oklahoma City the capital city of the Sooner State Women's College World Series coming your way. Louisiana Lafayette making their fifth trip to the Women's College World Series against the number one national seed, the Florida Gators, making their first appearance here in Oklahoma City. With Michelle Smith and Holly Rowe, I'm Eric Collins. It has been a coming out party for Ashley Brignac. Just a freshman wearing double zero. She has 11 strikeouts through four and two thirds. Check it. She's got 12 strikeouts through five. She strands the runner on at first. She strikes out the side for the third time today. We have played five complete. Nothing's been settled. It's a 2-2 tie in Oklahoma City. It is crystal clear that we have a fantastic ball game on our hands. Through five innings, a 2-2 tie. Florida with six hits. Louisiana Lafayette with five. The Gators with the game's only error. Stacy Nelson, the SEC Pitcher of the Year. Her first toss here in the sixth inning is a ball downstairs to the third sacker for Louisiana Lafayette, Melissa Verdi. It'll be Verdi, Bowers, and Bridges against Nelson. Good changeup sails across the inside part of the plate, one and one. And that's the pitch, Eric, that I think that both of these programs need to use more as we get later in the game. The more at-bats, the more pitches that these hitters see, you got to keep them off balance with that off-speed. Verdi takes outside. Verdi playing with that thick knee brace on her left leg. She tore her ACL in the game against the U.S. national team back in March, but only sat out for about a week and a half and came back playing like her hair's been on fire. And this, a possible extra base hit. She stumbles coming around the bag at first, and the slide, she's safe. Oh, that was an adventure for Birdie. I hope she's okay. Oh, she stumbled rounding the bag at first, and I thought she was just going to anchor herself at the bag. She continues on to second. You can see the pitch on the outside corner. She drives it the up, uh, opposite way. She does a good job of looking. She stumbles a little bit and hesitates, but continues on for a close play into second. If you look at the pitch. You can see it's a little bit sweet on the inside corner, and she drives it the other way. Nice defensive play by Anaya out at left field. Close play at second. So we're going to have a pinch runner. It's going to be Kelly Cormier coming in and running for Verdi. And I'm not sure. It looked as if almost that Verdi was thinking, did I miss the bag at first and should I go back to first? I don't know. Maybe we can get another chance to look at that as the pitch misses downstairs to Bowers. She came awfully close to missing that bag at first. We can see. Oh. Her step, oh, oh, nice recovery. Her step just prior to the bag. She slips a little bit. She gets off rhythm. But that's in really good body awareness to drag that toe over the corner of the bag. Nice running work. Nice running that, by Verdi. That's not an automatic out. Florida would have had to notice her miss the bag and appeal the play at first base to get granted that out. Foul ball, third base side off the bat of Bowers. We were told that Verdi is not supposed to slide. But she did anyway. This one is feet head first. I guess maybe that's okay playing as a torn ACL. 
it's the women's college world series so i guarantee you it's a it's a close play she's going down swing and a miss nelson looking for the strikeout she gets it bowers cannot move the runner over to third instead she goes back to the dugout strikeout victim number four against nelson So the pinch runner Cormier still on at second, and this is Gabby Bridges, freshman hitter, who takes outside ball one. Let's go down to Holly. Holly, what do you have? Well, to see their te her teammate uh, leg out a double like that with no ACL, that's really fired up this dugout. When Verde ran over here, though, the first thing she said to her teammates over and over, that hurt. That really hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Holly. I can't imagine playing with a torn ACL. These kids have a lot of guts, a lot of fire and tenacity and you know but it shows how much they want this crown <laughs> bridges good take ball almost hits her and the count is three balls and no strikes bridges is flying out to left field both the second and the fourth innings and now meeting in the circle the catcher Hilbert He's going to talk things over with Nelson. So no one from the coaching staff goes out and talks things over. Instead, it's just the battery. I'm sure that it's important for Hilberth to go out and tell Nelson, look, don't get too care careful. Continue to throw your pitches. Believe in them. They're moving. We've got a great defense behind you. Let's just play ball. 3-0 pitch. And that went off the knob of the bat. Tough break. For Bridges. That's just going to be a foul ball. It went off the knob of the bat. She was just trying to get out of the way. It's like a rise ball up in the zone, and you can see that the way Bridges is moving in just a little bit goes off the knob of the bat, and that's unfortunate because that would have been ball four for Bridges. Swinging on 3 1. And it's a high fly ball playable in center field. Wallazonia makes the catch, and here comes Cormier to third, and she's safe. Wow, gutsy base running for Cormier. I thought she was dead to rights, but she makes it with a creative slide. Cormier very lucky in this situation that Walzona has a good job of throwing the ball in, but she needs to make a crisper throw a little bit more online. Nice try on the tag by Brooks to sweep around. Cormier dives, moves past on her slide, overslides the bag. Look at the way Brooks does a sweep tag, misses her, throws just a little bit offline. High pop up, and that's going to be caught by the catcher, Hilbreth, to end the inning. So the leadoff double by Birdie goes by the wayside. They advance the pinch runner over to third, but they cannot score. Home half of the sixth is next. We're tied at two. Guarantees, but I just got a feeling it's going to be like this all week long. Gut check time in Oklahoma City. Let's take a look at our Coke Zero game track, a 2-2 tie in the home half of the sixth. We've seen some outstanding pitching so far, some great clutch hitting. I think the one thing that when Florida looks back so far on this game, they're going to realize that they've left a decent number of runners on base. It's hard to win games when you have a lot of LOBs. Christina Hilbreth leads things off for the Florida Gators, and she swings at a pitch up by her eyes and comes up empty. It'll be Hilbreth, Brooks, and then the top of the lineup, Wallazonia, against the freshman Ashley Brignac. Last year, she was the Gatorade National High School Player of the Year. John Curtis High School in River Ridge, Louisiana, a suburb of Louisiana. Pop up, back to the screen. 
Talked about those left on base. That's just going to be something that is just going to haunt Florida if they can't win this game. They have left at least one on in every inning of today's game. Back in the third, they left the bases loaded. 0-2, slapped foul. A big part of this game is you want to get runners on early in the inning. You want to advance them into scoring position, which ironically enough, we've seen neither program do. Nobody's really put down the sacrifice button here today. But once you get them in the scoring position, you need one person to step up and get that big clutch hit. Rignac looking for her 13th punch out. And she gets it. 13 strikeouts for the 19-year-old. Rignac has recorded 16 outs. Of those 16 outs, 13 have been via the strikeout. Well, Brignac worked her screwball early and often, and now she's working the rise ball. Look at the way this pitch is just going to move way out of the zone. It goes from high to higher. Hillbreath just chases that pitch up the ladder. It's going to be important for this Florida team to make Brignac throw strikes. This ties the season high in strikeouts on the year. 13 strikeouts so far through five and a third innings for Brignac. Corey Brooks, the third baseman, takes a called strike. And one of the things that you see when you have a power pitcher matched up against a power hitting team or an aggressive team, they, they swing freely. Very important to zone back in as a hitter, make that pitcher throw you strikes. You talk about the difference between the screw ball that was thrown earlier in the game and the rise ball now. Is that the pitcher Brignac working with her catcher Bowers, or is that someone in the coaching staff saying, okay, this is going to be what we're going to be featuring this time around the lineup? Well, that's the coaching staff. And, in, and Joy Weber for the Raging Cajuns, the assistant coach, calls the game for Bowers, the catcher, and for Ashley Brignac, the, the pitcher. So it's important that these the, the battery, basically, they just kind of get into overdrive. They look for the sign, and then they execute the pitch. And Joy Weber, who is the the assistant coach and who actually was a member of this Louisiana Lafayette team, was a catcher herself, is doing a very good job of calling today's game and calling for this, this young pitching staff for the Raging Cajuns. One, two. Rook stays alive. In the on-deck circle, the leadoff hitter, Kim Wallazonia. There she is, first team all SEC. Florida with 67 wins in their first 70 games so far this year. They're one away from the all time NCAA record for wins in a season. Not as even at two and two. The only three teams that have defeated the Florida Gators so far this season Long Beach State. Alabama in conference play, and in the regional round, Central Florida. That's it. Change up outside. Tim Walton's team currently tied with Tennessee, UIC, back in 1999, and the Arizona Wildcats in 1998 for the most single season wins in Division I. How about those flames? Illinois Chicago <laughs> that pitch 67 miles per hour so Brignac still bringing it when she wants to Brignac I think the biggest thing that she's doing later on in the game here is that she's not predictable earlier on in the game she was working that that screwball quite a bit into righties away from lefties and you're seeing her and there's a good shot of Joy Weber calling the pitches that Bowers taking is so important for pitchers not to be predictable. Foul ball, third base side. And you're talking about being predictable. I've noticed that the last couple of pitches, it seems as if Brignac is taking more time between her pitches. She's going back to the, the edge of the circle. She's picking up that rosin bag and being fairly deliberate as opposed to what she was earlier. Well, she's pacing herself. I think earlier in the game that she was working a little bit quick. Her pitch count has risen. I think she's trying to relax, get in her own rhythm, and work her own pace. Ball blooped out into right field. 
coming on to making the catch is Tankersley for out number two. Let's go down to Holly Rowe with a special report. Holly. Well, this next batter for Florida, Kim Walazonia, has really overcome a personal tragedy this year. She took the fall semester off after it was learned her father, Les, had bile duct cancer. She decided she wanted to go home and be with him, that she would rather spend his final days together. She slept at the hospital, took care of him. And when she rejoined the team in January, she said it has been very, very difficult, especially after he passed away to focus. She said, I feel like I've just barely got my focus back at the plate in the SEC tournament. Guys, they have really admired how tough she's been this season fighting through the personal tragedy. Thanks, Holly. Yeah, the numbers she put up this year, dealing with everything she's had to deal with, just amazing. First team all SEC, and like she said, she really didn't feel like mentally she was in it until just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, she was having a hard time really focusing in during her at-bats, and um, you know, hitting takes a lot of concentration, and I'm sure that going through the, the sort of tragedy her family has gone through, it's been very easy to um, to allow your mind to, to stray away, but you, you got to give this kid a lot of credit for what she's pulled through. A lot of times, one of the great things about being a part of a team is you have a lot of different people that you can lean on when things aren't going exactly the way you'd like. Yeah, a lot of sisters to help take care of you. 1-1 one, one pitch. Fouled away, 1-2. and two. Wallazonia looking for her first base hit of this Women's College World Series. A couple of ground outs and a strikeout looking. And there, if we talk about the tragedy that, that Wallazonia's family has gone through, but then you also look at the, 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 her opponents, the Raging Cajuns, a lot of these women and their families from the local New Orleans area actually went through Katrina, and they've dealt with uh, issues of, of loss uh, as well in, in their family. You hear a lot of these kids talk about, well, how are you going to handle the stress of the College World Series? And they're like, well, you know, that's not stress. Stress is going through Katrina or having to leave your home for four months and not be able to to come back or you know losing a loved one so it's amazing the perspective that a lot of these young athletes have here in this college world series Ashley Brignac's family was displaced she is from the New Orleans area and was out of her home for a while her family's home didn't suffer nearly as much damage as other homes did around New Orleans but still she was forced to evacuate and spend weeks away from her home in New Orleans Ball and two strikes on Wallazonia. Two outs. Downstairs, two and two. The Gators have never defeated Louisiana Lafayette in the game of women's softball. They've played three times, and they've lost all three. The most recent coming back in 2002. Strike three, outer half for the second time today. Wallazonia strikes out looking to end an inning. That is now 14 strikeouts for Ashley Brignac. We played six, absolutely nothing has been decided, except for we've got two evenly matched teams going at it on the diamond. Welcome back everyone to ASA Hall of Fame Stadium in Oklahoma City. This is day one of the Women's College World Series. Let's take a look at our Two brackets, Louisiana Lafayette, Florida currently tied at two. Texas A&M with two national championships, taking on Virginia Tech immediately following this game. And then this evening, what we're calling loosely the, the Pac-10 bracket, three Pac-10 teams going at it, Arizona State, Arizona, UCLA. And the only uh, outsider is the Alabama Crimson Tide coming out of the SEC. You can catch both those games this evening on ESPN. Arizona State, Alabama, and then Arizona against UCLA. Combine those two schools with 18 national championships in softball. Carly Hubbard will lead things off. It'll be Hubbard, Smith, and Gaspar. 8, 9, and 1 in the Raging Cajun lineup, working against Stacy Nelson, who has thrown just over 90 pitches so far today, actually 92, compared to 143 tosses for Ashley Brignac. Brignac is, really has an elevated pitch count. Nelson, who gets more ground outs, less strikeouts, obviously, but more ground outs, has a much lower pitch count. We'll see how that plays in as this game progresses now in the seventh inning. 
Take a look at Nelson. Uh, what's impressive is 58 strikes, 93 total pitches. Chopped into the ground, foul. Down will even at two balls and two strikes. And I'm sure there's just one pitch that Nelson wishes she has back, and that was the Vanessa Soto double in the fifth inning. Did you get a good read on what that pitch was? Looked like it was a drop that was supposed to be a little bit lower. It was inside, and it came in just a little bit above the knee, and Soto was able to get her hands extended and drive that ball out into the green. Off-speed pitch, misses downstairs, three and two. So Hubbard just trying to lead off this inning by getting on any way possible. Nelson needs to throw a strike here. And Hubbard stays alive. The Raging Cajuns, formerly southwestern Louisiana, have been to this tournament four previous times. This is their fifth appearance. First time in 1993 when they were called University of Southwestern Louisiana. Back then they were coached by Yvette Girard, now at LSU. Across the diamond, the throw is high, but Gardner stays on the bag. Out number one here in the seventh. Some huge names in this year's tournament that we will see over the next week. Katie Cochran, an outstanding hitter for ASU, Taryn Mowat. Can't say enough about her in last year's championship here. She was just on fire. You didn't see on that list Megan Gibson. That's right. And Megan Gibson had a real puncher's chance at being named USA Softball Player of the Year. She was beaten out by Angela Tincher. Megan Gibson playing for Texas A&M. And Tincher, outstanding pitcher. Megan Gibson, just phenomenal numbers as well. And she hits. Number three hitter for that Texas A&M team. So Megan Gibson is just a lot of fun to watch. Senior pitcher in the circle. Yeah, I'm not in a hurry to have this game come to a close, but when it does, I'm really looking forward to seeing Texas A&M Virginia Tech later on this afternoon. It's going to be a battle. Change up, a beauty. One and two now. Stacy Nelson has thrown heat all day, and look at this changeup. She flips that pitch in backward. Nice location, low outside corner. And Katie Smith, the slapper, as she's running through the box, it's going to be very difficult to hit an off-speed pitch, especially one that is floating to the outside corner of the plate. A lot of run and slap left or left-handed hitters will have a tendency to start running down the line. It's hard to hit that outside pitch, especially when it's off-speed. Downstairs, count goes full, three and two. And that pitch again, another off speed. So Nelson now has gone to a full count on each of the first two batters here in the seventh inning. She's fooling around with the bottom of the lineup for the Raging Cajuns. She was able to get the number eight hitter Hubbard, but now working against the number nine hitter Smith, and she gets her out as well. It's a strikeout for Nelson, her fifth of the afternoon. Nelson shows Katie Smith a couple of off speeds and then she comes back with a screwball low and out on the outside corner. Look at the way she flips this ball out. It moves away from Katie Smith, left-handed slapper. Blue gives her the call. So two outs, top of the seventh inning. Valley Gaspar takes upstairs, ball one. Gaspar singled and scored her last time up. Gaspar and Hubbard both coming around on that two out double by Vanessa Soto. Good strike out or half one on one. Winner of this game will advance to tomorrow's game five and take on the winner of our next game, Texas A&M and Virginia Tech. The Texas A&M Virginia Tech game is right here on ESPN as well. The loser moves down to the loser's bracket, and they will take on the loser of Texas A&M, Virginia Tech. That game won't take place until Saturday, 7 p.m. Eastern time start on ESPN. 
One two pitch half hearted swing and that's not going to do it. Gaspar strikes out back to back punch outs for Nelson. She's done her job. We move to the home half of the seventh inning. The Gators can win it with a run when we come back. Usual we are in Oklahoma City Oklahoma. This is day one of this fantastic event and a bunch of top steppers trying to urge the Florida Gators on. Let's go down to Holly Rowe. Act, trying to close out the number one team in the country. Just before she took the field, she was standing here. Some fans in the stand said, Ashley, you've got this. She looked up, gave them a huge smile, her dimple sh showing, and shook her head as if to say, yeah, I know, I've got this. Now <laughs> let's see if she does. Now it's not going to be an easy road to hoe. She's going to take on two, three, and four in the Gator lineup. Bakulba, Gardner, and Anea. So if she does get through this inning, she'll have earned it. First pitch strike to Asia Pakulba. 14 strikeouts, a career high for Brignac. Yeah, Brignac, she's worked the rise ball, seven strikeouts by the way of the rise, six by the screwball, that pitch on the outside corner to a righty, looks like a little bit of a curve. She's worked one down, drop ball, so she's moving the eyes of these Florida batters all around. She's not allowing them to get into one one particular pattern or one part of the plate. She's moving that ball all around. That was her 146th pitch. And we're talking high effort pitches. She's pumping everything up there. Yeah, power pitchers typically throw from their toes all the way up to their head. You'll hear him grunt, you'll see him stride off about seven and a half to eight feet. Another strikeout for Brignan. 15 punch outs for the freshman. Back, you can see the swing back, gets nice long and extended, throws that rise from low to high. And Eric, when you throw that rise ball, it's very important for hitters to be disciplined. They need to be thinking that anything above their hands or anything above their numbers, they are not going to be swinging at. This ball is laced down the left field line in foul territory. It's off the wall. Nothing but a loud strike. Katie Smith going all out for that one. That one may have hurt. There's padding on the wall, but not where she hit it. Katie Smith has had quite a few balls, but you can look at the way she loses her traction. She's going into that ball hard. Nothing but a strike going one. Allie Gardner is the batter. Gardner is singled, walked, and struck out. Upstairs, one and one. First team all SEC performer. Junior, transfer from UNC Wilmington. Had that batting average over 400 for the bulk of the season. That was pitch number 150 for Ashley Brignac. Look at the ratio of balls to strikes. 103 strikes out of those 150 pitches. High pop fly out of play. In case you're wondering, the Florida Gators, en route to those 67 wins that they have, they have won just twice. Two of their 67 wins have come in games where they've had to win in their last at bat. They did one in conference play against South Carolina back in March. Also in March, they did it against the Stanford Cardinal. Allie Cardinal actually hit a game winning home run against USC in that game in March. She's batting right now, and she takes upstairs two and two. Gators trying to be the first ever team from the SEC to win a Women's College World Series. Both them and Alabama with opportunities this year. Pitch. 
Outside. How careful would Brignac be right now on a 3-2 pitch? Is a walk the worst thing in the world? No, walk, walk is not the worst thing in the world. So to a number three hitter, I mean, this part of the game, I think you have to put something close to the zone, but you cannot put something fat in the zone. Gardner will make you pay for it. Outside, great at bat for Gardner. She works the walk. That's the second time today that Brignac has walked Gardner. And this is going to be a factor. Allie Gardner earlier today was pinch run for. Because that happened, they no longer can pinch run for her, so she's going to have to stay on the base pass for Tim Walton, and she is not the fastest of Gators. So we'll see if there's a ball hit to the gap, whether or not she could score, or more than likely any of their pinch runners would be able to from first. There's Gardner looking to get coached up on how to get faster immediately. <laughs> Pump those arms. Yeah, that woman may be the only person on the diamond who's not going to beat her in a foot race, and that's uh, Melissa Verdi, who's got a torn ACL. Verdi ran pretty well getting the second base on that double, though. You could tell she uh, had the fire in her eyes. She was going to make it to that bag. Pressure situation now for Ashley Brignac, the freshman right-hander, trying to get out of this jam. The cleanup hitter, Francesca Enea. Team leader and runs batted in. Trying to drive in the game winner, and she takes a strike, one and one. Enea has an older sister, Christina Enea, who was known as one of the best clutch hitters in the history of the Oklahoma Sooners program. Now younger sister trying to follow in big sister's footsteps. Quality 66 mile an hour pitch. And now Anaya is down to the count. A ball and two strikes. And Anaya looks at a good pitch on the outside corner. It's very important for this Gator team to be aggressive on good pitches that are over the plate. You cannot watch those. You've got to be aggressive on those. High pop up. It'll stay in the dirt. Catch is made by Soto. Two down. Gardner still on at first base. And now Ashley Brignac has only Mary Ratliff standing between her and extra innings. Ratliff has not put the ball in play so far today against Brignac. She's walked twice. I've checked that. She's struck out twice and walked. Does Ratliff know that she has not touched the ball yet against Brignac? Is that in your head right now? No, I don't think so. I think uh, I think she's she knows she's got to be aggressive on on good pitches. But now, as a hitter, you never think about those things. I mean, you, you go up there and and you you know, obviously what you've struck out on. So you want to be looking for that pitch. But no. Ratliff has been a hero already this season. In a win back in March against Stanford, she had a game-winning home run in the seventh inning. Home run right here would do the trick. Just overpowered her. What do you look for here down in the count, one and two? Well, what you would like to see is something low and inside. I don't think they're going to get that. I think that they're going to keep getting the rise ball because Florida has been very free swinging at the pitch up in the zone. This ball is hit high. It's hit well, but not well enough. The catch is made by Tankersley about 10 feet in front of the right center field wall. And how about this, folks? We're going to have extra softball for you. The eighth is next. We're tied at two. Welcome back, everyone, to Oklahoma City, our first game of the day. We're going to have four coming your way, and we're going to have extra innings here in this game number one. The number one national seed, the Florida Gators, tied with Louisiana Lafayette at two. 
In case you missed anything, just take a look at the recap of today's game. Well, Florida gets on the board early. A big double by Corey Brooks. Drives the ball down the line in the second inning. And then in the fourth inning, nice hit by Pakulba driving this ball down the line. Puts the Gators up 2 to nothing. But Louisiana Lafayette answers. Vanessa Soto drives the ball deep off the fence. The Raging Cajuns come back and score two. All tied, two apiece. Both teams have played their share of extra inning games so far this season. For well, the Florida Gators, they have been in five extra inning tilts, winning three of them. So two of their three losses on the year have come in extra innings. And Louisiana Lafayette's dugout, they know that they have won two out of the three extra inning games that they have played. Is this the same? Louisiana Lafayette team you thought you were going to see and the same Florida Gator team you thought you were going to see or did you think that maybe one of these teams was playing tight or the other one playing looser? What do you see so far? The graphic showing right here that this is the 79th extra inning game. And look at that, the longest game in College World Series history, 25 innings, 1984. And that's back when the sport was played at 40 feet. We are now at a 43-foot pitching distance. But getting back to your question, Eric, I'm surprised that Florida has not adjusted a little bit better. They made some adjustments early in the game off of Brignac, but so far toward the, the end part of the game, they have been free swinging at Brignac's rise ball. They cannot catch up to that pitch. So I'm surprised we haven't seen Florida make a couple more adjustments. And Nelson, I think she's pitched a good game. Just that one pitch, that one mistake to Vanessa Soto is what really has hurt her. So. Louisiana Lafayette, they have nothing to lose. They made it through a regional and a super regional where they were outranked. Very young team. They believe they can do it. I'm impressed with the way they've played ball all the way around. Soto takes upstairs. Good hitters count. Two balls, one strike. Soto two for three so far today. Struck out just getting her feet wet back in the first inning. Then singled in the fourth and had that two-run double in the fifth. Change up. Upstairs, outside, not sure, but it's a ball. Uh, off speed pitch, full Soto. It looks like it possibly fools the blue as well. And sometimes you'll see that. If you don't throw change ups very often, all of a sudden you've, you know you slip one in, it doesn't just fool the batter, it fools, fools the umpire as well. Third base side, just out of the reach of Corey Brooks. The third baseman gave it a good effort and comes up empty. Brooks running after this ball. It's very important to not run with your hands extended. You can see Brooks, look at the way she's running with her glove out. It's important to use your arms, pump your arms, get to the spot where the ball's coming down, then put your glove out and make that catch. Easier said than done. Yeah, that would have been a here. miraculous catch if you made it. But that's the way you want to play it. Very important when you're going after a ball that's hit over your head or you're going back for it. Use your arms, pump those arms. 3-2 pitch, hit hard to the third baseman. Brooks across the diamond, out number one. So Soto is retired, and that's a big out recorded by Stacy Nelson. So the number three hitter, Holly Tankersley, will bat. Still in search of her first base hit. The Sun Belt Player of the Year. The first team All-American drives it deep to right center, and it's gone. And Eric, that is just the second home run of the year that Stacy Nelson has given up. That is a huge hit for Holly Tankersley. Tankersley was due, and she cashes in in the top of the eighth inning. You gotta respect Tankersley. I'm sure Stacy Nelson does, but that ball, it was right to be hit. A lot of times when you see a ball go out of the park, it's because the pitch is a little sweet. You can see Nelson throws a screw ball, and it's actually not that high. 
but you can see the power of Tankersley. What does she do? She gets her hands extended. She gets those hands to the ball and drives it. That ball just jumps off of her bat. Not a bad pitch. So for the first time in today's game, the Raging Cajuns have a lead on the Florida Gators. Melissa Verdi is the batter. Louisiana Lafayette, champions of the Sun Belt, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Florida Gators, the champions of the SEC, and the number one national seed in this year's tournament. And now we're going to have a meeting in the circle. The entire infield is going to talk things over, trying to keep this game manageable for the Gators. Well, Stacey Nelson has thrown a good game. I think a couple of pitches that have gotten hit. I don't know that I would call them mistakes, Eric, but Again, the way the ball will jump off of the bat in this college game, if a, if a strong hitter can just get their hands extended, they're going to drive that ball out of the park. And we saw that with Vanessa Soto coming up with that big double in the fifth inning, and then Tankersley with that home run. Not necessarily a really bad pitch, just not fooled. And you have to continue to fool hitters. How do you do that? With movement or by changing speeds. And I think that if we could have seen Stacy Nelson change speeds a little bit more, she might have kept Tankersley a little bit more off balance. Seventh hit of the game, the longest one of the game. Tankersley untying this game. And in case you're looking towards the home half of the eighth inning, it'll be six, seven, and eight in the Gators lineup. DeFelice, Bush, and Hilbert, the scheduled three, unless they choose to go to their bench. This ball is fisted into center field, and it's going to get down. Verdi safe at first base. She was pinch run for earlier today. So you would assume that she's going to stay on and have to run here with one out in the eighth inning. And you see Verdi taking an inside pitch. She's jammed up just a little bit on this pitch, but she finishes her swing. Look at the way she really muscles that, muscles that swing and just gets the ball to loop into the outfield. A lot of young athletes, Eric, will not finish their swing when they're jammed up, and therefore the ball stays on the infield for an easy pop-up. If you can be strong enough to finish your swing, muscle that pitch out, a lot of times you'll get it to fall onto the green. Smitty, I want to ask you, with Verdi staying on to run at first base, they could replace her, but she would not be able to come in defensively back in the game. What's more important? Get a faster runner out there and get some insurance runs or keeping Birdie in the game so she can play defensively at third. I think defensively you keep her in the game. You already have the lead, so you don't need, I mean, extra runs are always a bonus, but you already have the lead, so therefore you want to keep the other team from scoring. Keep your best defense on the field. And obviously, Louisiana Lafayette agrees with you, so Birdie stays on at first. Atlanta Bowers, sophomore from Crosby, Texas, trying to keep the line moving. But she's down in the count 0-2. We talked about how important it is for Nelson to mix speeds, and since that home run, we've seen her mix speeds a little bit more. We'll have to see if it's just not a little bit too late, however. Outside, we're just getting started. This is the first of four games on ESPN today. Coming up about a half hour after our game, we will have Virginia Tech, led by the USA Softball College Player of the Year, Angela Tincher. She'll be throwing against Megan Gibson and Texas A&M. Potential double play ball, and well, they're not going to be able to get it to first in time. Verdi is retired as the force out is made at second. They are now two outs. Bowers replaces Verdi on at first, but there are now two outs. And now Gabby Bridges, the freshman, is going to go talk things over with Michael Loti. The Raging Cajuns, a perfect 3-0 in their school's history against the Florida Gators. And we're going to have a pitching change. Stacy Nelson, the SEC Pitcher of the Year, 
she is going to give way, and we will have our first pitching change of the Women's College World Series. Somewhat of a surprise, but Tim Walton is going to go to the bullpen, and let's see who he's going to bring in. It's going to be Stephanie Brombacher coming into the game. Did you see this coming, Smitty? No, I didn't. Not with two outs in the top of the eighth inning. I, I did not see that coming. That's a good question, but no. Okay, we'll try and get into the head of Tim Walton and figure out what this move means when we come back. New pitcher to tell you about in just a moment. Welcome back to Oklahoma City. Taking a look at Stacy Nelson, who is a full Nelson. She threw 124 pitches, working seven and two thirds, giving up three earned runs. She struck out six. Are you surprised that she is no longer in the game, replaced by Stephanie Brombach? Well, I, I am. I wasn't expecting it, but getting into Tim Walton's head and, and possibly what he could be doing is trying to, to basically chill Brignick let her think a little bit Brignack excuse me let her think a little bit about the lead that she's got to come back out now in the bottom of the the eighth inning um, you know it, it is a, a time when you're wondering what maybe coach Walton is thinking about another possibility would be for Brombacher just a freshman get her feet wet in case he does need her later on in the championships and not too many teams can go to that bullpen and pull out, pull out someone who's perfect 19 and 0 Stephanie Brombacher in relief of Stacy Nelson. Big cut. And Gabby Bridges comes up empty. And Brombacher, just a freshman, has a good rise ball, throws a curve ball. You will see who'll work that curve away from righties. Downstairs. The batter Bridges. She is the only person, with the exception of Tankersley, and I guess Soto on the double, she's the only person to elevate the ball against Stacey Nelson. She's 0 for 3, but all three of her outs were flyouts. Everyone else either struck out or grounded out. Oof. Two balls and two strikes. With that grunt, I thought that pitch was a little bit faster than 62 miles an hour. I thought it was more at 72. Runner on first base is Lana Bowers. Off the end of the bat, cue shot into right field. Bowers on her way to third, and she will make it with a slide. Ball bounces away, and Bridges moves into scoring position. Good base running by Bridges. So now a golden opportunity for the Raging Cajuns to rip this one wide open. Well, Brombacher working a pitch. It's a little bit low, but it's on the plate. And you can see the way that Bridges just catches up to that ball, drives it the opposite way. Nice piece of hitting, taking an outside pitch and driving it to the opposite field. Rook Broadhead makes a strike. One other thing to think about is Broadhead is batting against Brombacher. The pitcher, Brombacher, hasn't had much work as of late. They've been riding that right arm of Stacy Nelson. Brombacher hasn't appeared in a game in almost two weeks. 13 days since she appeared, and that was in game one of the regionals down in Gainesville. So she may be chipping off the rust right now. Yeah, she's going to need to get her feet wet in this College World Series, chip off the rust because she hasn't thrown to batters in a game situation. It's going to be important for this Gator staff if they do happen to lose this game that they have both those arms working well because once you get into the losers bracket here at the Women's College World Series double elimination it is a long road back. It can be done but it's not the road you want to take. The view doesn't change on that road. It's uphill the entire way. <laughs> Two one pitch. And she went too far, did Broadhead. Two balls and two strikes. Holly Tankersley, a home run with one out here in the eighth inning, has given Louisiana Lafayette a one-run lead. Change up, 54 mile an hour. This is outside. In the on-deck circle, Carly Hubbard. Swing and a miss. 
Brombacher gets out of it, but not before damage is done. Ashley Brignac is going to go out and try and save this game for the Louisiana Lafayette Raging Cajuns. Holly Tankersley leaves the tank, and now the Raging Cajuns three outs away from staying in the winner's bracket. Welcome back, everyone, to the capital city of Oklahoma. We're in Oklahoma City, where right now the Florida Gators are on the ropes. This is a double elimination tournament, but they do not want to win, lose that first game, and fall into the loser's bracket so quickly. Let's take a look at our Pontiac game-changing performance, and we don't have to rewind that far to see it. Well, Holly Tankersley takes an outside pitch. She just flicks her wrist, gets that bat extended, and drives that Stacy Nelson offering over the left center field fence. Huge hit for this Raging Cajun team. That coming in the top half of this eighth inning, the first lead of the day for the Raging Cajuns. And we've been scouring the record books. The last team to lose its first game and come back and win the title, 2003, the UCLA Bruins. Only been done twice, 2003, and then 20 years prior in 1983 with Texas A&M. There it is in, the, in graphic form. So here in the home half of the eighth inning, the Florida Gators, they have DeFelice, Bush, and Hilbert scheduled to hit. Against Ashley Brignac, who has already struck out 15. She hasn't been flawless. She's had just one, one, two, three innings so far through seven innings. First pitch, upstairs, ball one. Downstairs, two and oh. They have a change defensively behind Ashley Brignac. New right fielder, Holly Tankersley, is out of the game. She's replaced by Valley Gaspar. They're trying to get a little bit more speed out in right field. And Brignac, three consecutive pitches have missed the mark. There's Tankersley who hit that home run at the top of the eighth inning. Anyway, the deep release is swinging here, 3-0. No, I think you have to let this pitch go. Quality strike, three and one. What about a three and one? Yeah, no, if it's over the plate, you want to go get it. Foul, third base side, and Brignac right back in it. Brignac. Just a freshman, you have to be impressed by her, not just her style of pitching, but basically the way she's played it cool in the circle this entire game against the number one ranked team in the entire nation. Oh, gas. De Felice, I think, fouled that off her helmet. It looked like it went right up on her face mask. Good thing she had the face mask on. That was scary. Take a look at a rise ball shooting in, and you can see the way that DeFelice gets out and extended on this ball, but it just comes right back into her face, and that is the reason why a lot of these athletes use that face guard. One of the best players in that good hitting liner for the Arizona Wildcats, Stacy Chambers, missed all of last season after fouling the ball off of her face, had a severe concussion, really caused some damage. She's just now getting, getting back into shape. That can really be an issue. It's a good thing DeFelice has that face mask on there. Three balls and two strikes. Brignac. Hop up behind home plate to the screen. I don't know if this should be that much of a surprise that the Raging Cajuns are leading the Gators. In Cajun cooking, don't Cajuns actually eat gators? A lot of them. It happens. I thought that was crawfish. 
<laughs> oh no, you can do some good things with alligator. <laughs> Gator bites. Ball foul, third base side. Tastes just like chicken and cold. Does taste like chicken. I had it before. I don't know if we can get that in Oklahoma City. Don't think so. Three balls and two strikes. Tiffany DeFelice <laughs> trying to get on base any way possible. All right, what's the thinking here? Let's look at this. Look at a footloose and fancy free. Texas A&M is. They're just getting loose playing a hacky sack down the left field line. But not footloose and fancy free would be Ashley Brignac, who has just been throwing and throwing and throwing. Her arm must be hanging right now. The pitch count is just getting astronomical. It is getting astronomical. She's a freshman. She's a power pitcher. She moves the ball around. It's going to be important for her to make sure she ices, takes good care of her body. The Raging Cajuns win this game. They will come back and play tomorrow night against the winner of the following game, either Virginia Tech or Texas A&M. So 173 pitches. So it's very important. And look at that, 173 pitches. 118 of those strikes, 118 strikes. That's what a lot of pitchers throw in, in a game. It's going to be important for her to take care of her body, all these athletes, to hydrate well. It's warm here in Oklahoma City this year. And again, great at bat, DeFelice. Yeah, every one of these pitches has been full throttle, too. We're not talking just, you know, Beer League tosses up there. She is humping at 66, 67. Brignac has a long, aggressive stride. We talked about that earlier, making it out to the circle. The circle is eight feet off that pitching rubber. And another foul ball left side. And Brignac right now is just working everything hard enough. She's working that rise ball. Been working that screwball. Have not seen very many pitches down or off speed as of late. Three balls and two strikes. This at bat began with De Felice ahead of the count, three and zero. Oh. We have to count this up. How many consecutive strikes has Brignac thrown that De Felice has fouled off? Crunch some numbers here. I bet it has to be 10 straight strikes. And it is. 10 straight strikes that Brignac has thrown. The last eight in a row have been fouled. In the on deck circle, Megan Bush, the freshman shortstop. Christina Hilbert hits third this inning. Unless the Gators choose to go to that bench. There's a good look at Megan Bush. <laughs> Dee Felice has earned the scholarship in this battle alone. <laughs> what an at bat she's had. Yeah, she's battled, watched three straight balls, and has come back and fought off. Brignac's going to be brushing her teeth for the next three days with her left hand. She's not doing much with her right arm. <laughs> she is just bringing it. Let's do another. The 3 2. I hope they brought enough softballs to Oklahoma City. <laughs> and one of the things that, D, uh, that, that this team is doing well, and De Felice is also doing great in this at bat, is it's a 3 2 count. She's not going to leave it up to the umpire, Willie Newman, to make the call. And anything that is close, you have to go get, especially in this situation where it's the bottom of the eighth inning, your team's down by a run. And they're going to get more softballs. <laughs> they're opening up the boxes. And didn't think we have to use these until game three. Well, Florida has hit so many foul balls. And I think that's part of the reason why Brignac's, Brignac's pitch count is so elevated is the number of foul balls that Florida has hit. Almost every fan here is going to be leaving yeah. with a souvenir. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany DeFelice, freshman from Coral Springs, Florida. This is the 16th pitch she will see in this at bat. Oh, 
Who's going to blink first? Well, at this point, neither of them are. They're just both very aggressive on both ends. Great pitches. Great swings. The Florida Gators, the number one national seed. 67 wins in 70 games already this season. Only losses to Long Beach State, Alabama, and Central Florida. That's it. But right now, they trail Louisiana Lafayette 3 to 2 in the home half of the eighth inning. They need to score at least once to keep this game alive, twice, and it's over. And Tiffany DeFelice was in a bat of a lifetime. Felice going down and getting that pitch a little bit lower in the zone. Brignac has been working rise, a lot of up pitches. They try to come down in the zone to full De Felice, but she'll have none of that. So Brignac began this at bat against De Felice with three straight balls. Since then, she has hit the strike zone 15 consecutive times. The payoff, pop up. Will it stay in the field of play? No, it won't. What is happening with Brignac when she's, after every pitch, she's going to the back of the circle and touching her shins? I think at this point, either her rosin bag has run out and she's trying to dry her hand. She's probably sweaty, palms sweat a little bit. So she touches the dirt, touches the rosin bag, trying to keep the moisture from building between the ball and the palm of her hand. If that happens, the ball can slip out. There can be ball four. All right, when do we stop being amazed and just say, I can't believe it. This is, this is something we may never see again. That's now 20 pitches to DeFelice. Well, I'm impressed that DeFelice has fouled off some of these pitches. So at some point, you have to wonder, were any of these pitches balls? There's a point to be aggressive, but not to be over aggressive. You see, 20th pitch of the inning, and there's no outs. <laughs> this is already more pitches than she threw in the entire fifth inning. <laughs> to center field. Played perfectly is Hubbard. And how about that? Brignac wins the battle against DeFelice. And that is the way you earn an out. And I love that. DeFelice goes into that dugout and everyone, everyone waiting to greet her with high fives. That's an impressive at bat. Gators giving DeFelice some love. Boy, that's, that's an impressive at bat. That's what you want to see this late into the game, especially being down by one run. So Megan Bush, another freshman, will grab a bat. Another freshman versus freshman battle. Bush has not put the ball in play so far today. She struck out three times against Brignac. Hits this one. Foul, third base side. Out of play, one and one. The Raging Cajuns, back in 1993, they finished third in the Women's College World Series. They were eliminated by eventual champion Lisa Fernandez and the UCLA Bruins. This is their fifth trip to the Women's College World Series. Trying to knock down Florida in their very first trip ever to the Women's College World Series. Raging Cajuns winning the Baton Rouge Regional, winning the Houston Super Regional. Now trying to slip by the number one national seed, the Florida Gators. Remember, this is a double elimination tournament, so it's not the worst thing in the world for the loser of this game. But you don't ever want to dip into that loser's bracket because it's historically a very difficult road to the championship. A 
pop up behind home plate. Off with the mask is Bowers, and she watches it hit the screen. Three balls and two strikes. Let's see if it takes 17 more pitches for Brigneck to retire Bush. High pop up. Playable in the infield. The shortstop, the cut of the grass, broadhead for out number two. And with two down. And Louisiana Lafayette up by one. We're going to have a pinch hitter. Kristen Preby will bat. So Preby the final hope for Tim Walton's team here in game one of the Women's College World Series. Freshman from Moore Park, California. This is three consecutive freshmen hitting in the bottom of the eighth inning with the game on the line. Maybe one for ten on the year as a pinch hitter. Starts down in the count 0-1. And, and Eric, when you look back over your score sheet and, and this game, just one inning, the sixth inning, is the only inning that Louisiana Lafayette retired the Gators in order. One, two, three. And now the Gators down to their last strike. The Gators have left nine runners on base. The Florida Gators looking to avoid their fourth loss of this season. Brignac, the 0-2. Ashley Brignac. Here's her 194th pitch. Humpback liner cut by the shortstop broadhead, and that'll do it. It takes close to 200 pitches, but the freshman, Ashley Brignac, defeats the number one overall seed, the Florida Gators. Florida loses for just the fourth time in the last four months. Louisiana Lafayette has just been phenomenal in this game. They got great pitching. Clutch hitting when they needed it. Florida has got to be disappointed that they've left so many runners on base with opportunities galore to put the game out of reach. The final numbers on your screen are correct. Louisiana Lafayette, they win in eight innings. Three to two the final score, the big blow. Holly Tankersley with a solo home run in inning number eight. So let's take a look at the updated bracket. Louisiana Lafayette, the first team to win in this year's Women's College World Series. Coming up in less than a half an hour, we'll see Texas A&M taking on Angela Tincher and the Virginia Tech Hokies. Later on tonight, we'll see Arizona State, Alabama, and Arizona UCLA on ESPN. All right, we'll be back in less than a half hour. Now let's go to the studio and Steve Bunin.